At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging neck lines to show off the girls, and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible, and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number 9, Tiny Tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know. Because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Nails for Days. These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails, though, isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years, like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you could imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number 7, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful, and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves, but on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number 6, Tiny Tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. 
Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. Item number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Hi number four. Five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances, and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style, and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. Suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. Item number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waists. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced, even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. At number 10, kleptomania. 
If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift. Gift. But if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't wanna waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much, hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy. That is so much work. Even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin? They have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. 
Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long, because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number 5. Diamond Scandals Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this 12 million dollar necklace. Now she said that she would pay but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake, which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number 4, Test Drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again, well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated, but I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power, we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt's religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Atan. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Atan was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her and she wanted to find an escape and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Marie apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. 
Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because it was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. At number 10, Veil. Through this video, you will come to find out that a lot of the wedding traditions that we practice these days have some pretty messed up origins. We'll get through a lot of them throughout this list, but let's start off by talking about the bride's veil. These days, a lot of brides choose to wear a veil on their wedding day. With so many different styles to choose from, this accessory is known to add that extra little pizzazz, little spice to the look. But throughout history, veils were used for different things, some of them being a tad bit messed up. Just a smidge. The rather obvious reason for brides to wear a veil back in the day had to do with religion and staying modest. But this hasn't been the only reason for veils. In ancient Rome, brides wore veils because it was believed to be effective at warding off evil spirits. The most messed up reason for the veil though, at least in my opinion anyway, has to do with the wedding transaction, so to speak. Since back in the olden days, marrying your daughter off was seen as more of a transaction, brides would wear veils to cover their faces and they wouldn't be lifted until after they were proclaimed husband and wife so that the groom wouldn't be able to back out if he didn't like how his bride looked. Seems pretty messed up to me, but what are your thoughts on it? Tell us down in the comments. Number 9. When Doves Cry I've been to one wedding where they released doves, like actual real life doves, and I was like, do they actually do this? I couldn't believe my eyes. I didn't know it was a real thing. Why do we do this? Well, because doves mate for life, and they build a nest, and then they Netflix and chill until the end of their dove days. Sounds like perfect symbolism if I've ever heard it. Back in ancient Roman and Greek times, doves were often used as gifts from the bride to the groom. Pretty shitty gift if you ask me. Here's a bird that we now have to both take care of. The snow white ring neck dove is used by magicians. They can't fly too well. They don't have a homing instinct. Whereas rock doves, the ones commonly used in weddings that we see fly away over Nana's head, they have a homing instinct for hundreds of miles. So they're perfect for the gig. But they couldn't be released during foul weather and they needed two hours before the sun sets in order for them to fly home. The wedding band has less rules than the doves. That's amazing. Their riders much smaller. If you were to catch one of these doves at a wedding, you were also allowed to keep it back in the day. Also, great hands. I don't know who's catching birds or why they want to keep it and put it in their pocket, but you do you. At number eight, best man. These days, the role of the best man normally goes to the guy who's closest to the groom, whether that's a brother or a best friend. But back during the time where women were married off like property, the role of the best man was very different and was all about protecting one's assets. Back then, bride napping was actually very common, so if there was someone else who wanted to marry someone who was already promised to another person, they might try and steal her away for themselves. Yeah, why? 
I don't know. This is where the best man came in. The best man's job was to protect the bride, and if she was stolen, the best man would be the one to enter whatever battle or duel was necessary to get the bride back. The best man was literally there to be the best fighter. The best man was also there to watch over the bride to make sure that she didn't try and make a run for it herself. They really said, try to derail this wedding and see what happens. Number seven, a June wedding. As we're counting down this list slowly but surely, you've probably begun Begun fantasizing maybe about your own wedding one day. Maybe it's a beach wedding, maybe it's themed like a winter wonderland. Doesn't that sound cozy? It's your big day, get creative. They say the best month to get married is June, and from a Canadian point of view, I can absolutely agree with that. In ancient Roman times, however, getting married in June was a must, not just a thing you wanted to do. See, June was the month of the god Juno. They protect women in life when it comes to marriage and childbirth, so if it's between that and like, I don't know, Halloween, obviously we're gonna go with June. Better omens for sure. Another myth is that bathing was rarely done back then, so when majority of the population did finally you know, wash up at the end of May or beginning of June, that's often when it would happen. Everybody smelled nice, they felt good, and they wanted to celebrate. So it was perfect timing. Better get me while my pits smell good, you know? That's a myth, but I can also see it checking out. A June wedding in ancient Roman days was also done so that after a spring birth, the mother can quickly hop back into action and help with that summer's harvest. Maternity leave who? Never heard of her. At number six, hashtag twinning. You know how at weddings the bridesmaids are usually wearing matching outfits? Well, this tradition dates back centuries, though it has changed slightly over the years. Remember how I mentioned that people would sometimes try to kidnap the bride on her wedding day? Well, well, other than the best man and the groomsmen trying to play their part in protecting the bride from being taken, the bridesmaids also played a part in that too. The bridesmaids used to dress identically to the bride so that it would make it harder to spot her and therefore prevent anyone from kidnapping her. This practice dates all the way back to ancient Rome and feudal China and didn't really start to fade out of tradition until around the 1880s. These days you get a couple of gifts from the bride for being in her posse, but back then you didn't get any Anything, and you had to risk your safety for your girl Becky who doesn't even want to marry Jeff down the block. I don't know. Number five, a toast. My favorite part of a wedding has to be the speeches or the toasts. They're always way too long or too personal or you know what, just too depressing. Just way too sad, just tears. You're like, why, why are we talking about this? It's a nerve wracking part, even as a guest, just to get up randomly and be like, okay, look at me everyone, hi. No, I don't want to do that. Back in the 1800s though, only men were allowed to give these toasts. The oldest friend, the groom, the best man, and then the father of the bride. The whole thing would have been done in eight minutes. Guys suck at speeches. They're just like, uh, uh, a lot of ums, that's all I'm saying. Wedding toasts go back as far as the sixth century BC. When Greeks were getting married, the father of the bride would drink the first glass of wine just to make sure it wasn't poisoned or anything. Romans would also drop a piece of burnt toast into the wine in order to make the wine taste less bitter, hence the term toast. Yeah, now we get it. Yeah, wine was so bad back then, they had to use burnt toast crystal light just to get through the day. Yuck. At number four, transaction. I find it to be just a little bit messed up how before now, marriage was mostly about money or status and not about love. For a long time, people didn't get to choose who they got to marry and there was almost always some kind of monetary transaction involved in the wedding. This whole idea here is a reason for the traditional act of the bride's father walking her down the aisle and giving her away, so to speak. In the past, fathers of the bride and groom would come together to establish an agreement, like X amount of money for someone's daughter or whatever. Once that was set up, the wedding became a big deal to see if the transaction would actually go through and many precautions were put in place to make sure that no one backed out. One of those precautions was the act of the father walking his daughter down the aisle. This was done so that they stayed close to one another in the off chance that the groom or his family decided to back out. That really took the romance and sparkle out of weddings now. Number three, wedding cake. As the youngest of three, I can confirm that we get away with the most. The youngest often do. The middle child is just plain ignored, and then the oldest, well, they usually have the most responsibility in the family. Usually when a bride and groom cut the cake on their big day, it's for them. They save a piece till their anniversary, they put it in their partner's face, it's fun, whatever they want to do. Often in history, the eldest child would get the first slice. How lucky is that? When it came down to cutting the actual cake too, well, that meant that the bride is no longer a virgin. It's an awkward few bites. Wedding cakes today are delicious and they're pretty much an art form. TV shows are devoted to them, like Cake Boss and 
other cake shows that I can't think of. If you're lucky, you might find a few cake charms on the inside as well back in the day. Real, non-edible cake charms. You wanted to find these in your cake. They brought good omens to the table. To find a rocking chair meant that you are going to live a long life. An anchor means you're bound for adventure, sailors ahoy. And a purse meant that you would have good fortune. Let's just hope you didn't find the charms with your teeth or else you would be using said new fortune fixing your chiclets. Very metal, very real. <laughs> Not good. At number two, plague flowers. In a lot of weddings, the flowers are very important. There's the flowers for the centerpieces, the bouquets for the bride and bridesmaids. There's flowers everywhere. Get your Benadryl. But why is that? Well, the idea of carrying a bouquet at a wedding dates back to ancient Greece, where it was believed that carrying a bouquet was thought to ward off evil spirits. But a little later on down the line, the presence of bouquets at weddings got a little bit darker and a little more precautionary. During the Middle Ages into the Renaissance, when the Black Death was running rampant throughout Europe, people were trying anything and everything to try and ward off the plague. Back then, people believed that smells carried contagion, so people would fill their pockets with fragrant things to keep the plague at bay. This was later integrated into wedding practices and brides started carrying around a bouquet of stinky stuff like garlic and dill to protect them from catching anything. Over the years, the stinky stuff was replaced with nice smelling flowers, but really, no one cares what's in the bouquet anymore because all people want to do is participate in the wedding hunger games and fight to the death to catch the bouquet at the end of the night. Why? Why are we hurting each other for this? Why? And finally, number one, wedding rings. One ring to rule them all. Perhaps the most important piece of the wedding puzzle, rings. Whenever somebody is about to pop the question, everybody around them always needs to see the ring. Congrats, let me see the ring. Oh my god, is it this, is it this? Egyptian pharaohs first used rings to represent this eternal life. The circle has no beginning or ending. They created this concept that we adore to this day. The center of the ring was also believed to be the gateway to the unknown. Finger just disappears, you're like, what the f these Egyptian Ouroboros rings were the first, a snake eating its own tail, hashtag love. When Greeks came in the picture, they took this tradition, started using copper and iron rings in ceremonies, and the iron rings had a key symbol on them, meaning that the wife now has control of the house. If you like it, then you should have put a key on it. Come medieval times, the ring gets another upgrade. Now we have these precious gems to be added to them, a little bit more glam. Rubies symbolized passion, sapphires symbolized the heavens, and diamonds to show strength, because they were Rock hard, and obviously, you know the rest. Come the 12th century, the Christian church declared marriage as a holy sacrament, so rings were solely used now for that ceremony. That's when the engagement ring came into place. There needed to be another trade or promise that was just as strong as a wedding band. So now there's rings for pretty much everything. Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously, hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys. It's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know that's that's likely. So instead, they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes, if you were feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. 
Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health. And so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters, so she'd put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth, and yes, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian Laundry Day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when Laundry Day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn. But the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. And yeah. Number five. Urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day, and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes, and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee. Because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was just, it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, 
it was just not. It was like basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a shit. I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king, I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I have no I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously, today. Horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner Piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. 
Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you having a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar. Queen Rana Valona was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Loba the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's horrible. Rana Lova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted, nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman. He is justice. 
We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert. They viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. I'm number three, Evil Empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive. Good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe Cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, what would you do with your time? Really? And 
anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. Number 10, Julie Daubigny, a sword wielding opera singer? Uh, yes, sign me up, please. I am so here for this. There is so much to unpack about this story. So, she was born the daughter of the secretary of King Louis XIV's master of horse. She moved to the court of Versailles in 1682. Her father was an expert swordsman and educated her alongside the boys he taught because she was his only kid. She even dressed as a boy and excelled at the sport. She ran off with a fencing master and toured, showing off her skills to wide audiences. One audience member, however, couldn't believe she was a woman because she was so good, so she flashed the crowd, who responded with complete stunned silence. She began singing at the Marseille Opera where she met her first love, a young woman. This woman, though, was packed off to a convent by her family, and Julie followed to help her escape. They burned down the convent and ran off together, and she was actually sentenced to death by the parliament. But Julie would continue to live on one adventure after the next. She would later be pardoned by parliament and continued to go on to become an opera star and had many other lovers. Number 9, Betty Page. If you're a fan of pinup art, then you almost have to be a fan of the one, the only, Betty Page. She is the one who defined the art form. Page was an American pinup icon who scandalized society with her risque and alternative kink modeling photos. We can thank her for the bikini, as it was Page herself who made it popular. Pop stars to this very day model themselves after her, her iconic haircut being found on stars such as Katy Perry and Dita Von Teese, her poses in her famous Famous photos were found in music videos such as like, it's just, it's, she had a massive amount of influence. She redefined a sexually repressed era with her free spirit and unabashed presentation of her sexuality. But she was taken advantage of a lot of the time. Betty actually didn't make any royalties after her prince until Hugh Hefner got her an agent. But by the end of the 1950s, Betty walked away after a nervous breakdown and retired as a born again Christian. There was a lot of suffering that Betty didn't show to the world or even admit to herself. Sadly, the woman who's face everyone knew was diagnosed with schizophrenia due to severe trauma from her childhood. For years, no one knew if she had even passed away, but people were still obsessed with her until she was finally tracked down for a documentary. She refused to take any photos, but would give interviews over the phone. She finally hired a lawyer to try and recoup some of the money she lost for her image and spent her final days living with her brother in LA. Number 8, Cleopatra. Uh, duh. Uh... Cleopatra, the woman who had the world talking all the time. She made sure that whenever she entered the room, all eyes and ears were turned in her direction, jaws on the floor. She is one of, if not the most famous Egyptian queen to ever have lived. Believing she was the goddess Isis herself, she prepared dazzling entrances wherever she went. But it wasn't just her looks, in fact, some accounts say she wasn't actually particularly outstanding in that department. It was just the whole package and how she presented herself. It was indeed her wit, charm, intense intelligence that had men and nations kneeling to her. Her brother slash husband wasn't a huge fan, as it was clear she was always trying to get past him to hold the whole title. But one way she overstepped her husband was when she had herself delivered to the Roman Emperor Caesar wrapped in a carpet naked. She easily won the senior emperor and gained him as her lover and eventually she even won the Egyptian throne, soon to become the famous Queen of the Nile. Number 7, Mary Laveau. Mary Laveau is an absolute legend in practice and by lore. Her mysterious past and practices made her the absolute talk of the town. She was the voodoo queen of New Orleans. Voodoo or voodoo is a combination of West African religions brought over to the Americas through the slave trade. It then blended with Christianity and the traditions of indigenous peoples. Marie was 
was the first generation of her family to be born free. But due to laws and practices of the time, Marie and her husband bought and sold around 8 slaves in their lifetime. Though it was also believed that she aided in the escape of slaves as well. But what she is most famous for is her work as a voodoo queen in New Orleans. Many wealthy and politically connected individuals paid Laveau to aid in personal advice, intervention and protection from evil energy. She also worked as a hairdresser which gave her access to information regarding her clients because honestly let's be honest everyone's hairdresser is their therapist. Honestly what didn't this woman do? She also ran an orphanage and helped many children have a safe home. Laveau is a popular figure in legend and lore due to her relationship to the occult but her role in society was much larger and a little bit more scandalous than that. Number 6 Louisa Cassati Also known as the Divine Marquise, we have yet another woman of mystery on this list. Louisa Cassati beguiled everyone she came across. She was a young, well born heiress who married into the Lombardy aristocracy. The mundane was an insult to her. She dressed in extravagance wherever she went, dyeing her hair fiery shades, darkening her eyes with makeup and contouring with coal. Her guiding principle in life was to imitate art, as opposed to art imitating life. But due to her extravagant presentation, she became the muse of dozens of famous artists. Thanks to her immense fortune, she traveled the world, leaving a trail of lavish parties that even Gatsby would gawk at. Every party topped the last. She had a collection of very special drugs, naked servants gilded in gold, wild animals. Her tombstone reads, age cannot wither her nor custom stale her infinite variety. Number 5 Madam CJ Walker Madam CJ Walker broke records and blasted through glass ceilings as the first self made female person of color millionaire in America. She made her fortune thanks to her homemade line of hair care products for black women. Her parents were slaves who worked in Louisiana, but she was the first of their children to be born free after the Emancipation Proclamation. After an experience with hair loss, she created the Walker system of hair care. She had a knack for self promotion that started by selling directly to the clients and then employed beauty culturalists to hand sell her wares. She not only continued to build her business, but she also kept a hand behind her to help lead future generations towards success. Walker used her fortune to help fund scholarships for women, donated large sums to NAACP and the Black YMCA, among other charities. An absolute legacy. Number 4 Mary Wollstonecraft Mary Wollstonecraft is a feminist icon who began setting the groundwork for women's rights all the way back in the late 1700s. She authored A Vindication of Rights of Women in 1792, which is considered the earliest treaties advocating for women's rights. Wollstonecraft was born in the Age of the Enlightenment in England. The Enlightenment is pretty much as it sounds, an intellectual period which advocated for reason to obtain objective truths. As part of this movement, Mary and her sister founded a girls school in London in 1780 to educate young girls. She continued to write articles advocating for the education and equality of women in society throughout her life. She believed that if women weren't educated to the same degree as men were, then society would come to a standstill. Sadly, Mary never fully saw the success of her ideas. She died during the birth of her second daughter, Mary, who, funny enough, would go on to write one of the most controversial books in history, Frankenstein. Number three, Mae West. I see a man in your life. Not only one. Mae West. As sassy as she was on screen, she was even more so off of it. Her wisecracking, quippy sensuality became a sensation people couldn't get enough of. West started out in vaudeville and Broadway before she hit the big screen, singing and doing acrobatics. By 1926, Mae began to write and produce her own plays, the first being titled Sex. Her performance was of a woman of the night and you can imagine the stir she caused. It also earned her an 8 day jail sentence for corrupting the morals of youth. She loved to ridicule social attitudes towards sexuality, which became a part of her trademark style. She was also a big supporter of the gay community, even writing a play called Drag as a celebration of drag in New York City, on top of it being a living room comedy. As you can guess, this also stirred up some serious controversy. But despite it all, Wes seemed to enjoy the reaction of the private and reserved public, loving every minute that it made her famous. Number 2 Marsha P. Johnson Marsha P. Johnson is most famously known for her work to help support the LGBT LGBTQ plus movement in New York City for nearly 25 years. Marsha played a key role in the Stonewall riots that found the gay pride movement today. She was a drag performer and black trans woman who did everything she could to advocate for trans youth, homeless people and people living through the AIDS epidemic. She even used money she earned as a night worker to help fund a refugee for homeless people. Along with fellow activist Sylvia Rivera, she founded STAR, Street Transvestite Action Revolutionaries, which created a safe place for homeless trans youth to sleep and feel safe. It was the first LGBT 
LGBTQ plus shelter in North America. Sadly, however, Johnson never got to see how far the movement would take the world as she died in 1992. Her body was found in the Hudson River and it was ruled that she took her own life. However, many suspect foul play as her case was never actually investigated, they just assumed. Many activists believe today that someone had indeed taken her life. Marsha P. Johnson danced, performed, and rioted her way to making the public listen to the voices people were afraid to hear, and her legacy lives on today. And last but not least, Rosa Parks. One of the loudest scandals in history that ferried in waves of change was the decision Rosa Parks made one day to stay seated on a bus. It was a scandal that transformed the world. In 1955, Parks refused to give up her seat on the bus to a white man from Montgomery, Alabama. This simple and brave refusal initiated the civil rights movement in the United States. Her actions inspired the Montgomery bus boycott, led by a young Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Up until this point, bus segregation was enforced, and and the black community was forced to sit in the back of the bus always. It was also customary for bus drivers to request that black citizens give up their seat to white citizens. So one day when Parks was riding home from work, she was exhausted, the bus driver asked part of the back of the bus to stand to make room for a white citizen. Parks was the only one who refused and she was arrested as a result. In her autobiography, Parks writes, and I quote, People always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired, but that isn't true. I was not tired physically, no. the only tired I was was tired of giving in. At number 10, the king of hobbies. Everyone has their interests, right? Like for example, I like video games and I like watching people scream at their teammates for not helping everyone else out. I'm looking at you Blake. For kings, back in the day they didn't have people on Rocket League to scream at so they had to find other interests. For Tsar Peter the Great, he had a lot of interests and they were all very bizarre. Firstly, he had an obsession with short people, especially dwarves. To him, they were like his real life dolls or something and he would hold weddings for them and even hold lavish funerals, complete with small horses pulling a small coffin on a carriage and even a very short priest to hold the ceremony. But other than this obsession with short people, he also dabbled a bit in medicine. He liked watching surgeries be performed like he was trying to be on Grey's Anatomy or something, but when watching the surgeries just wasn't enough for him, he would sometimes perform them himself. Now remember, He's not a doctor, so it's no surprise to learn that these surgeries rarely ever went well and people died. I certainly wouldn't trust him to give me any kind of surgery, but he was a king so he could do whatever he wanted. Peter the Great also loved dentistry. It is said that if you wanted to get all buddy buddy with the king, all you had to do was let him pull your tooth. Sounds like the guy was one heartbreak away from starting his own medical drama, but in the worst way. Number 9. Banning Coffee This is the worst of the worst, people. Murad the Fourth, Sultan of the Ottoman Empire. The guy banned coffee. Coffee, like an absolute monster. No more triple triples for you. He was born in 1612 and for the most part his mother was ruling through him because he was so young. That's often the case with most of these young rulers. They just get, hey you're seven, now you rule a kingdom, enjoy. It's, you know, it's tough, they're not going to know what's going on. But when he got a little bit older he put forth these laws, punishable by death, might I add, in order to get things back on track. That was the key. He banned coffee, tobacco, and alcohol. He would actually disguise himself as a civilian during the nighttime and would wander around aimlessly in hopes that he would find one of these dark roast renegades. If you were caught outside having a quick smoke break, you weren't arrested, you didn't get fined, but rather, Murad IV himself would take your head off right there in the streets. No trial, no jury, just straight to execution. All because you're drinking a Bud Light Lime. At number eight, why you mad? Now this could be a bit of a controversial opinion, but if your name includes the words the mad, I would assume that you're not doing too great, right? I mean, you have to earn that title, and if it's a title that harsh, that simply begs the question, what in the H-E double hockey sticks did you do to get that name? Well, for Charles the Mad, he did a lot. Charles became king when he was only 11 years old, so that certainly didn't help his development and knowing this kind of helps explain a lot of his actions. He was known for getting really angry and throwing fits of rage and was known to give people the gift of the big sleep, if you know what I mean. Charles didn't always kill people though, only sometimes. Other times he liked to switch things up. Sometimes he would run around his palace pretending to be a wolf. Other times he would go through phases where he just really didn't want to keep up with his personal hygiene and he would get so gross that he literally had to be cut out of his own clothes. Now I don't know how long you have to go without bathing to get to that point, but really I don't think I want to know the answer to that question. Charles also thought that he was made of glass and so he would go through phases where he would sit completely still so that he didn't break. Kind of like Drax from Guardians of the Galaxy, but not as, you know, extraterrestrial. Well, maybe he was. That honestly would explain a lot. Number 7. 
party hard. Zhu Huzhao was the emperor of the Ming Dynasty in the early 1500s. Now lately we've been talking about kings and queens, we're on part twos for both now, and there's a good amount who simply just aren't ready, they're too young to rule. Like Joffrey from Game of Thrones, kings like that actually existed, they were horrible. They were young, they were too young to know what was right and wrong. Plus they usually have some corrupt parents whispering in their ears the entire time. Zhu took the throne at just age 14, and for a while, ministers were confident that he would grow into the role and become the leader that he was born to be. Well, when he got older, he transformed a zoo just outside of Beijing. He transformed it into his own personal brothel. Yum. I mean, on one hand, I'm glad the animals are free, but like, a zoo? You couldn't find a more romantic place? Can convert an Applebee's to a brothel, maybe? I don't know, something with AC? His final days were spent partying, and some would say a little bit too hard. He got intoxicated and fell from a boat. That's how he ended his life. Honestly, not a bad way to go out. Pretty OG. At number six, love game. A lot of kings and queens throughout history have been known to engage in the horizontal hustle a lot. I mean, when you're a ruler of a kingdom, you don't really have much to do in your spare time. So what else are you gonna do? Play a board game? No. These monarchs were getting busy all the time, but there was one king who was just so obsessed with getting a good old pickle tickle that it just became his whole personality. King Philip V was known to be a nymphomaniac, and he liked doing the deed a lot, but because at the time, the Catholic Church said that having sexy time with anyone but your spouse was a sin, the king and his wife were getting busy all the time. Eventually his first wife caught on to how to use this to her advantage and she would often refuse to sleep with him until she got her way with anything she suggested or demanded from him. You would think that he would catch on to this game, but maybe his urges were just so strong because he always caved and gave her what he wanted. Obviously this man did not follow Hoodville. Absolutely not. Just to give you guys an idea of how obsessed this guy was, when his wife was on her deathbed, before she went eh, he literally tried to get one last bang in. On her deathbed. Like dude, not the time. Number five, George V. We love hobbies here on Bumblebee. I mean, I used to collect special quarters growing up. I swear to God, the only time I've ever been good at saving money was when I was 12. I would see one of these and be like, mm, don't touch it. George V turned out he loved stamps. A lot, like a lot, a lot. Since he was a wee young lad, he was collecting these little guys. Here's the unusually impressive part about him though and his hobby, he continued to collect stamps during World War I. This guy was busy, everybody's trying to stay alive and George is just licking stamps in the library like a prince. Like all collections, it started at an early age and now it's at the point where it's past impressive and it's just borderline strange. This guy had albums on albums of stamps. He had around 330 albums, each with 60 pages full of stamps. Quick maths, that's like 20,000 pages full of stamps. So naturally he was nicknamed the king of stamps, or rather the king of philately, the official term for collecting stamps. It's a nice word. Philately. Philately. Back in 1905 he set an all-time stamp record, which I didn't even know that was the thing, and it was the most money ever spent on a single stamp. The guy dropped like 220,000 US on a single stamp. Somebody even asked the prince down the road if he had heard about this idiot who spent 1,400 pounds on a stamp, and he was proud of it. He was like, that was me, that was me, you wanna see it? The next King George is a little different to say the least. At number four, Womanizer. I'm going to preface this by saying that George IV of England was voted as England's worst king by historians, so that should already tell you a lot about this guy. Georgie here was yet another one of those monarchs who was a little too invested in his intimate conquests, you know? Now we do know that the encounters that he was on were all consensual, so that's a plus. However, he was still creepy about it, yeah. This man tried everything to get a woman to sleep with him, he would throw a tantrum if she said no, or threaten to end his life if he didn't get to do the eight-legged nature dance, you know? Somehow, this had a pretty good success rate, even though he was not a catch at all. It feels like this was one of those situations where you kind of just give in to make him stop talking, you know? Anyways, this guy was super creepy, because on top of the lengths that he would go to just to get some time in the sack, he also kept trophies of his conquests. He would ask each of the people he slept with for a lock of their hair, and he kept them all. Back then, it was kind of common for lovers to keep locks of each other's hair, but George's collection was alarming because of just how many locks of hair there were. After the king died, his brothers found 7,000 envelopes, each with a lock of hair that was, quote, enough to stuff a sofa, end quote. 
Fun fact, if you want to see this insane collection, it is in a museum in Scotland, so check that out if you want, I guess. Number three, kleptomania part two. On our spoiled queens list, Brie mentioned Queen Mary and how she just couldn't stop stealing, which is hilarious to me, just this old lady stealing your sh well, the last king of Egypt also had sticky fingers. He was even better at it too. Check this out. Farouk I was the youngest son of Egypt's first king, Fouad I. Now, born in 1920 in Alexandria and in his early days at school, he couldn't concentrate. The king sent him to England even after to hopefully find a better way of teaching, something that works for him, but still it was to no avail. Once the king passed away in 1936, Farouk then got the throne, but also so much property and so much money. He had hundreds of fancy cars, 75,000 acres of land. This guy had it all. Literally, he had anything he could think of, but still, he felt like he needed to take more, to steal. At 17 years old, he would slam 12 eggs for breakfast and then wash it down with 30 bottles of beer. Nutritious and delicious. Horrible. On top of the fact that he loved to steal, he was the biggest hoarder. So he had thousands of shirts, randomly. He also had 50 diamond studded walking sticks for some reason. And like a prince such as myself, he too collected coins. I mean, his collection was much nicer, but still, great minds think alike. Spoiled minds think alike, rather. Oh shit, this is eye opening. One of the most bizarre facts about Farouk was he pickpocketed Winston Churchill once. He took the guy's watch. After everything I just said, he still decided to steal his watch. What a gem. We love him. We are at number two, the king of pettiness. Let's talk about a ruler that the Indian state of Alwar has described as controversial. If his own people are calling him controversial, then you know something's up. And boy, you better strap in because you're in for a wild ride with this one. Maharaja Jai Singh was pretty eccentric in a pretty dark way. He was known to have a temper and act on impulse, and he did some very questionable and downright scary scary things. He was known to be very competitive and hated to lose. One time while playing polo, he and his team lost and so in retaliation he blamed the horse he was using and made the horse get extra crispy. He uh, fired his horse. I'm sure you know where I'm going by that. If not, use your noodle, I don't know. Unfortunately, the cruelty towards living things didn't stop in animals and he was also known to kidnap women from the streets and go all criminal minds on them. On a slightly lighter note though, the Maharaja was also known to be very petty. Once he went into a Rolls Royce dealership and the person working there thought that he was broke and ignored him. Thinking that this was insanely rude, he bought seven Rolls Royces, sent them back to India and used them to pick up garbage. This guy was really just doing the absolute most. And coming in at our number one spot, King Ludwig II. Home renovation shows rock my world. I can watch Love It or List It for months at a time. It's the dream, building your own home one day. And if you're a king, well, it's pretty easy to get that done. In our Spoiled Queens part two, I mentioned a princess that had a house made of ice, literal ice. Well, King Ludwig II had numerous castles built to resemble fairy tales, literally like, fairy tales. I gotta admit, I kind of love this a lot. Ludwig was only 18 when he became the king of Bavaria in 1864, and then he had castles, like castles, more than one, built after he was inspired from romantic literature and spending some time at the opera. The kid was a dreamer, you gotta love it. He would spend his nights in one castle looking through a telescope at his new castle being built. So he would just watch it all night. That's like the king's way of waiting for your Amazon delivery. Just standing there, just like, it's coming. 17 years and it's done. Just four years in, he designed his own castle and to this day, it's one of the most photographed places in the world. Neutrenstein Castle. Go check it out. It's literally a paradise. Kicking off the list at number 10, Madame de Pompadour. One of the most powerful women in the 18th century, France, Madame de Pompadour is known mainly as the mistress of King Louis XV of France. The last ever portrait of her shows us a respectable middle-aged woman piercing through your skull or your soul. I don't know why I said skull, it's pretty intense, but we'll keep it right through your skull, apparently. Since her birth in 1721, she was well-educated and quickly she became a member of the French court. She is remembered mainly as the official chief mistress of King Louis XV from 1745 to 1751. But in 1756, she was officially named the 13th lady in waiting. That's a pretty big deal. Over her lifetime, she became the political advisor to the king, which many historians aren't too fond of. But to be fair, she put in the work to get his attention. She would show up to his 
place in a carriage at night. She would put on plays, like actual productions where she was the lead. I don't know why I did Peter Pan, but hey, that's how I do it. She would perform plays about nymphs and the gods, so if that doesn't deserve a super like, I'm not really sure what does. Number 9, Veronica Franco. Born of a merchant man and his wife, a courtesan, Veronica was destined for a movie worthy life. Franco lived in the 1500s and her father ensured that she was equipped with a strong education. She quickly found a love for reading and writing, her poetry becoming part of her legacy later on. Sadly though, her beloved father died very suddenly, leaving her family close to ruin. And so, her mother stepped in to give her a different sort of education. She was an excellent student. And though she married a much older doctor when she was just 16 years old, she was later unfaithful with a merchant dissolving the marriage entirely. She then became known as an honest courtesan, meaning she was highly educated and could fraternize with important and dignified personnel of the time. She had a short affair with King Henry III of France. She also continued her writing pursuits and was even accepted in one of the most well known literary circles in Venice, and two of her volumes were published. This is in the 1500s, keep in mind, that's, that's incredibly rare. As a sexually free and intellectual woman, she would have made quite the stir. Sadly, she died penniless at 45 after she lost all of her wealth in the plague. But she is forever immortalized for her poetry and her philanthropy in helping old and destitute courtesans. Prior to the plague, she planned to build a safe house for them. Number 8, Mata Hari. Birth name Margarita Zell, this scandalous figure in history, was an exotic dancer with a tragic past turned. Super spy. At age 27, Mata moved to Paris and reinvented herself as an artiste. As most do at that age and that time of their life, she tapped into her Dutch roots and started to perform these dance acts under the alias Lady Gresha McLeod. She was the first dancer, check this out, the first dancer to go fully nude. Her shows, of course, got busy. People were into this new found idea. She was the talk of the town, many towns for that matter. And eventually she got so good she started to tour. Yeah, like Green Day, she would tour all around. For years she would travel around Europe and perform these sold out crowds, but the most intriguing part was her clientele. These military officers and aristocrats would give her gifts after these shows. They wanted to hang out, of course. They were in love after a performance like that. Mata was on board, she loved this. Especially coming from a tragic, horrible marriage previously, this was the life that she needed. So around 1914, her dancing days were starting to decline, those patellas were starting to catch up to her, plus the war also broke out and things changed. Hari ended up being sent back to Holland and was later approached by Karl Kromer, German counsel in Amsterdam, because the men she was in contact with were considered a valuable asset at this time. So she went from being a dancer to a spy, codenamed H21. That's so sick. James Bond who? Number seven, Empress Theodora. Theodora from the brothel, as she's often known as. I don't know why, but here we are. From actress to marrying Emperor Justinian I, Empress Theodora had quite the life. The two ruled together during the golden period of the Byzantine Empire. She was the most powerful woman ever seen in Byzantium. Just like her mother, Theodora was born into the theater and would travel performing acrobatics, dancing and stripping, while also working as a lady of the night because the kind of the two went hand in hand. She was said to have danced a particularly lurid routine with geese. Don't let your imagination run too far with that one. So how did she marry an emperor? Well, there was a tradition in the Byzantine court for emperors to marry beauty contest winners. Entrants could be from any class. But Justinian still had to amend that law that stated he couldn't marry an actress to make it happen. But she was the most beautiful, so you know, do it up. 20 years his junior, Justinian ensured she was crowned as his equal. As they were matched in intelligence, ambition, and energy, the two heralded a new era for the Byzantine Empire. Number six, Cleopatra. Cleopatra had some wild methods herself to get attention, you know, believing she was the goddess Isis. She tried to appear as the goddess as often as she could. So she would do so by preparing these dazzling entrances everywhere she went. She would also look fabulous. She's known as like the most beautiful queen ever for this reason. The most famous entrance she made was in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria. This was an important time in ancient Egypt. There were problems with the family. She was banished at this time, but she still wanted to meet the Roman general Caesar. Hmm, how do you meet the man nicknamed the bald adulterer without being seen? Well, she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack like a bowling ball and then personally hand delivered right to Caesar's bedroom. DoorDash. King, see ya. I'm gonna sneak into concerts by using this method, see if it actually works. So she won the heart of Rome's future dictator, great, and then eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Quite the play if you ask me. Now her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in a following battle, he drowned in the Nile, leading to Cleopatra's ultimate return to the throne. All you gotta do is 
Take your clothes off and jump in a sack. See ya. Number five, Nell Gwynn. Good old, pretty, witty Nell Gwynn. Perhaps one of, if not the most, famous actress to ever take up the stages of old. Women were not allowed to perform in theaters until King Charles II took up the throne after Cromwell banned theater altogether, because he was the worst. To bring back some spice to the world, not only did he bring back theater, he brought women to the stage, because seeing them dressed up as men was kind of hot because they had wore tights. Anyways, enter Nell Gwynn, who would later become his mistress. She started out as an orange seller in his theaters. Very very often synonymous with being a lady of the night, but her natural wit and charm caught the eye of an actor named Charles Hart. She soon became his lover, but she soon joined the troupe as a comedic actress. She had a series of lovers before King Charles became enamored with her among his other love affairs. The guy was busy. She wasn't greedy, but Charles couldn't help but spoil her. She never received a title, but after calling their son a right in front of them and she was like what else am I supposed to call him? Their son became the Duke of St. Albans. The public adored her and was the only royal mistress in history to provoke public adoration. Once while she was in a coach, the public thought she was the Duchess of Portsmouth. Instead, she stuck her head out the window and said, pray good people be civil, I am the Protestant Good for you, Nell. She died sadly just past her 30s, likely due to the lead makeup she wore. She survived the king by just two years, and when he died, he said, please take care of Nell Gwynn, because she's the cutest. Number four, Marilyn Monroe. We've all heard her name, but do we even know why? Who was Marilyn Monroe? Real name, Norma Jean. She was an actor in LA who over time became a sex symbol. She was in numerous blockbusters around the 50s, and to this day, she's still an icon. Her fame, of course, meant unwanted attention at times, most times. Like so many celebrities now, her private life was the center of attention, and it was quite a lot to deal with alone, I'm sure, let alone the entire world watching you and judging you. The rumors going around about her and John F. Kennedy and how she was having an affair, and then she divorced her third husband right after that happened, and then just at age 36, she was found next to a bottle of Namboodle pills, which were sleeping pills. Following a celebrity's life can be pretty harmful, especially when you hold them up to this standard because they're famous or they're good looking, it's toxic. If Marilyn Monroe was alive today and this all happened now, it would probably be even worse because now we have bored people on TikTok. So she'd probably have a worse time. Number three, the Marquis de Sade. Ooh, we're getting spicy. This man was so wild that people are startled to learn that he was actually real. He is the founder of the term sadism, which should say a lot about him. And he was known for his scandalous and erotic texts that the public hungered for. Donatien Alphonse Francois Marquis de Sade lived from 1740 to 1814 and died in a mental asylum. His works were banned in France all the way up till 1957. Even his very name was scrubbed from the family legacy. Descendants, along with a very interesting historian found his work bricked up behind a wall in the attic of Condé Castle. The erotica he wrote is even too extreme by today's standards. He literally held nothing back. To people who admire him, his novels are about exploring the dark hidden impulses of human nature. Saad fought hard against the civilized restraints on behavior imposed on the state, while others interpret his work as a justification for all the awful crimes he committed. 120 Days in Sodom is his most famous work, which he wrote while imprisoned in the Bastille before being let out during the revolution. Many look back upon him today as a philosopher who challenged control and ideas, all while still making any new reader blush. Number two, Anne Boleyn. This was considered one of the biggest scandals ever, this entire marriage. King Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn were married. Anne was his second wife, and she was crowned queen in 1533, but only three years later, in 1536, she was charged with adultery, conspiracy against the king, and incest. Even worse, she was found guilty. And come May 19th, 1536, she had her head taken off at Tower Green. Cut to today, was Anne Boleyn falsely accused? What do we know? Well, many believe that King Henry issued these charges in order to get Anne just out of the picture. She didn't produce a male heir, and right after she was executed, King Henry married his third wife, Jane Seymour, with the main goal in mind to have a son. Now, originally, Anne was a member of Henry's court. She was a maid of honor to Catherine, his first wife, and in typical kingly fashion, he tried to sleep around with her, but she wasn't into him initially. Now, when they did get married, it was quite the task. Divorce was a no-go under the Catholic Church, so Henry argued that Anne had previously married his brother Arthur. He argued that the Pope wrongfully granted that marriage, so he found a Pope loophole. 
What? And of course at number one we have Giacomo Casanova. This man left behind his colorful life story wrapped within the pages of an erotic memoir. It was so scandalous that even the censored version was put on the Vatican's list of prohibited books. But in 2011 his scandalous pages were put on display making the public blush. But it wasn't just his tales of sex and love that would shock you, but the sheer craziness of the life he lived. He lived from 1725 to 1798 and was the son of an actress. In film adaptations with David Tennant and Heath Ledger, he is depicted as an all out playboy with unwavering charm. But he was also a true enlightened polymath. Voltaire, Catherine the Great, Benjamin Franklin and Mozart all hung out with this dude. He was a gambler, an astrologer, a spy, a traveler, wrote a proto feminist pamphlet and a science fiction novel. He basically invented the lottery, saved a man who was being accidentally killed by his doctors, he fluctuated from penniless to extremely rich to penniless at the end of his life and wrote his memoir while working as a librarian of all things. In and amongst his adventures were over 120 notorious love affairs with countesses, milkmaids and even nuns. Sword fights, escapes, cons, arrests, the life of Casanova made for a very interesting read. At number 10, marriages. If there's anything we've learned on this channel after talking about marriages so many times, it's that marriages long ago were rarely for love, and this still goes for the samurai. After the samurai really started to flourish during the Edo period, they became some of the highest ranked people in Japanese society. As we've learned before on this channel, when you are a person of high status, your marriages become more of a political or financial bargain than anything else, and these marriages were usually arranged. This meant that a lot of samurai were involved in arranged marriages so as to boost the statuses of other families families. As you can imagine, this rarely went over well with the people who were actually being forced to marry, as many of them would have already fallen in love with other people prior to this arrangement. This unfortunately led to a lot of couples to take their own lives rather than marry other people, which is quite Shakespearean when you come to think about it. It was a messed up system, but when it comes to status, people would do anything to make their families more respected, even at the cost of other people's happiness. At number 9, Weapon Testing The Katana Everyone knows it. This was the most famous weapon used by the samurai, and as it was an important weapon, they had to be tested before being put in the hands of Japan's most famous warriors. The elaborate testing that these katanas were put through was called tameshigiri, which translates to test cut in English. This process would have the sword's owner cut through different materials like bamboo, wood, or armor, but there was a darker side to these tests too. The gruesome subsection to tameshigiri testing was called sumonogiri which translates to the cutting of tied objects. Now you would think, oh, these tied objects were just things like bamboo tied to a tree or something. But no, the tied objects were dead bodies. Yeah, katanas were being tested on dead people. The bodies that were normally used for these weapons testing were usually those of dead criminals, but that doesn't make it any less terrifying. It makes you think twice about how these swords got their bloody stamp of approval, especially as sometimes the amount of bodies that the sword cut through would be inscribed on the side of the blade. Creepy. Now, before we carry on talking about the messed up things that the samurai did, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far? And while you're at it, maybe consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number eight, poverty. When one thinks of a samurai warrior, you don't really think of them as impoverished. I mean, at one point, they were seen as members of high society, but there also came a time that the samurai started to see money as, quote, too tainted to mess with, so they made a conscious effort to avoid it. After the Tokugawa shoguns of the Edo period felt having warm clothing and plenty of food would be detrimental to society, the samurai took this to heart and began living lives of poverty. This has been widely believed because people have grown accustomed to believing in the idea of the noble, humble, and honorable samurai, but historians believe that these impoverished samurai could have been influenced by a number of reasons, like their status in society and having things change too quickly for them. Psychological poverty seems to be one of the running theories as to why the samurai started living lives of squalor because they had grown accustomed to their wealth and power that their expectations of such rose higher than their actual income. At number 7, Wakashudo. As it turns out, the samurai were surprisingly open-minded about same-sex marriage. However, on the flip side, there was a darker side to their same-sex pairings. Back in the days of the samurai, there was a tradition called Wakashudo where younger men were required to pair up with older samurai. They would essentially become something 
something of a combination of trainees as well as field wives for an older samurai. In return, the older man would be a mentor to his young companion. He would train him and protect his companion until his apprenticeship was completed, where the young man would then move up in ranks. This sounds like it could have been effective in theory, however the practice of wakashudo wasn't exactly voluntary. Young warriors were expected to follow in this tradition and it was believed that if a handsome young man didn't yield to his older lover, then he would be acting shamefully and this shame would follow him into the next life, resulting him in being disfigured and weak. These young men were being coaxed into this through fear, which is pretty messed up if you ask me. At number 6, Ruthless. This next fact about the samurai is certainly one of the most terrifying, so brace yourselves, bumblebees. One of the most messed up traditions of the samurai was something called sushigiri, which when translated means roadside killings, and it's pretty much as straightforward as the name gets. This practice has its roots in honorable duelings, but later became much, much darker and evolved into a practice where samurai would sneak around to unexpectedly slash at passing merchants and peasants. What makes this a little more sick and twisted is the excuses that some samurai would give in order to justify their actions. Some would claim that they were simply looking to test their weapon, or they were practicing a new strike, while others would claim that they just felt like attacking someone. Talk about messed up, right? To make things even darker though, there was even a legend floating around at the time that claimed that 1,000 sushigiri killings could cure an illness. Sushigiri became such a prevalent issue that it became banned in 1602, but even then it didn't just stop overnight and instead just fizzled out over time, meaning that peasants and merchants were never truly safe from these samurai sneak attacks. At number 5, Wives. Now, after learning what we have so far, you can come to understand that the life of a samurai wasn't exactly sunshine and rainbows, right? Well, I'm about to tell you about people in the lives of samurai who arguably had it worse than the warriors. Being married to a samurai meant that there was a lot of honor to uphold, and that was a lot of pressure. As a result, there was an act that was performed by the wives of the samurai to uphold their honor of their husbands and their family. Some of you may be familiar with the practice of seppuku, and if not, we will get into that in a moment but essentially it was a method of taking your life in an honorable way. This practice was reserved for the samurai, but their wives had their own variation called Jigai. This practice was focused on swiftness and dignity and would be performed for a number of reasons, from anointing from her family's shame to preserving her honor in the event of an enemy invasion. But most commonly though, Jigai was performed by wives whose husbands performed seppuku as samurai wives felt it necessary to end her life if her husband had done the same. The women would tie their knees together as to not be discovered in a compromising position, then she would slit her throat and end her life. At number 4, Last Stand. As we are no doubt familiar, in life all things must end, and such is the same with the samurai. Though they were the noble warriors of Japan for many dynasties, eventually things had to change. Towards the end of the 1800s, Japan was looking to enter in more modern times, and with that they were disbanding the samurai clans. By 1877, only one clan remained, and they refused to go down without a fight, and a fight is exactly what they got. On September 25th, 1877, the government sent in 30,000 soldiers to fight the last samurai clan, but with only 500 men and limited supplies, they didn't really stand much of a chance. They knew that this would be their final battle, and so the night before the battle, they had one last sake party, and in the morning, they stormed into battle. Three hours into the fight, only 40 men were left alive. The samurai leader had been fatally wounded, and not too long after that, the remaining fighters were overtaken by the opposing force, thus ending the last samurai clan. At number three, insults. In another installment of dumb reasons the samurai would randomly kill people, let's talk about the practice of killing people who insulted others. These days, if we feel as though we've been insulted by someone, usually a clap back is in order, but back in the days of the samurai, things were a little different and a lot bloodier. The samurai were allowed to practice something called kirisude gomen, which translates to authorization to cut and leave. Essentially, the samurai were given the authority to legally kill someone if they felt like they had been insulted or disrespected. 
The only fine print to this was that the killing had to happen immediately after they were disrespected and the victim was a member of the lower class. The initial insult and subsequent retaliation by the samurai also had to have been witnessed by someone else who could back up the samurai story, but the samurai were allowed to use their own friends and servants as witnesses, which seems a little biased, but then again we're talking about killing people because your feelings were mildly bruised. The only downside that this posed to the samurai is that if they were found guilty of misusing their authority to practice Kirisute Gomen, they would be given a severe punishment of beheading and their house would be abolished, meaning that the samurai's son would not be able to inherit the title of samurai after their father's passing. At number 2, Seppuku. Now remember I mentioned the practice of seppuku a little while ago? Well, let's talk about it. Seppuku was a ritualistic method of taking your own life where a samurai would slice his stomach open with a small sword. This was seen as an honorable way to die on the battlefield and was established sometime during the 12th century. There were two variations on performing seppuku. One was slicing the abdomen vertically and horizontally, then the samurai would just bleed out and die in excruciating and drawn out death. Doesn't really sound too jazzy to me. But the other and arguably less excruciating way was for the samurai to perform a horizontal cut across his abdomen, then immediately following that, his comrade would decapitate him, ending his life instantly. Still a pretty horrific way to go, but at least it's a lot quicker than the other method, right? Outside of the battlefield though, when a samurai would prepare to take his own life, he would first write a death poem, have a couple shots of sake, and then perform the ritual. And finally, at number one, for the streets. Now let's get to talking about what I think is probably the most bizarre and messed up thing that the samurai did. During a period of peace, the samurai didn't really have anything to do. I mean, they were warriors. But when there were no battles or wars to fight in, they kind of got bored. Their swords were just sitting there, gathering dust. So what did they do to fight their boredom? Well, they took to the streets, of course. A number of unemployed samurai from the Edo period took to the streets and formed gangs with other highborn youths. One street gang called the Kabukimono were known for being quite flamboyant, wearing strange clothes and using strange slang, and they would roam the streets harassing people and getting into fights with other gangs. The natural enemy of the Kabukimono was the rival gang called Kyokagu, and they were known as vigilantes made up of lower class people who protected the people. The clashes between Kyokagu and Kabukimono caused a lot of bloody gang violence in the Edo period, so even when there was no outside conflicts, there was still bloodshed. At number 10, Latin. Out of all of the dead languages, Latin is probably one of the most well known. You might be saying, well, it isn't completely dead because Latin is still somewhat around in society. While you do have a point, Latin is still considered a dead language because no one speaks it. It is still used to classify animal species and science and is also used in medical terms as well, but you won't hear someone speaking Latin just out and about. The most Latin that the average person would use in normal everyday speech would be saying some kind of Latin phrase like carpe diem, which means seize the day, or memento mori, which means remember you must die. Certainly not as upbeat as carpe diem, but it's still got the same principle. These days, the only country that uses Latin as their official language is the Vatican. And yes, for those who never knew this, Vatican City is its own country. The reason why Latin is their official language is because the holy scriptures are written in this dead language. They are the only ones who have kept up with it after the language started dying out after the fall of Rome. At number 9, Sanskrit. The ancient language Sanskrit is the oldest language in the world, but unfortunately the language died out around 600 BCE, so a very long time ago. Though it died out so long ago, it still seems to be holding on a little bit, even in modern day in some countries. Currently, Sanskrit is considered one of India's official languages because of the fact that many ancient scriptures regarding Buddhism, Jainism, and Hinduism are written in this ancient language. Sanskrit also holds on to a lot of popularity among scholars as it is a popular study for many students because of its ties to many ancient philosophical works like the spiritual and medical theories written by the popular philosopher Vedas. Before we carry on talking about some of humanity's dead languages, why not consider leaving a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far and subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one. On number 8, Ancient Greek. Up next we have a pretty special language, this being Ancient Greek. Many people still study some Ancient Greek because of the works of some of Ancient Greece's most famous philosophers like Socrates, Aristotle, Plato, and Homer. On top of that, much like Latin, many scientific terminologies are written in Ancient Greek. 
Now, I mentioned that this is a pretty special language, so let me tell you about what makes it so unique. The death of ancient Greek is pretty special because it didn't necessarily die out completely. Strange, I know. You see, rather than the language dying out completely, it simply got transformed into what we now know as modern Greek. So really, it's not exactly the same, but it just evolved into something new. Now, modern Greek is used as the official language of Greece. Even though the language, or rather some of its remnants, are still around, ancient Greek is still studied to this day, and fun fact, many words from the English language are derived from ancient Greek. At number 7, Biblical Hebrew. The death of the Biblical Hebrew language is a pretty sad one. There are many ways for a culture or language to die out, and most times it has to do with some kind of conflict, overtaking, or assimilation. In the case of Biblical Hebrew, this language died out in the 20th century due to warfare and persecution. Biblical Hebrew initially saw its decline after the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem, but after the events of World War II and the persecution of the Jewish population, Biblical Hebrew lost any hope of returning. Most of the rabbis who could have passed along this language died during the war, and so this ancient 8,000 word language transformed into modern Hebrew. It is still possible to learn the language, but no one really uses it anymore. One cool thing about learning this language though is the fact that it would be a much easier language to pick up than any other dead language. At number 6, Old English. Obviously, we need to talk about the language that came before ours, that being Old English. This is the language that came before the modern English that we speak today, and even before the middle and early modern English that you may be familiar with if you ever had to study Shakespeare. It was the first recorded stage of the English language that was used and spoken up until approximately the 1150s. Old English had three genders to the language, masculine, neuter, and feminine. Old English, also referred to as Anglo-Saxon English, was spoken by people in England and Scotland. Hence, the name. Eventually, it evolved into a more grammatically correct version of English that we call Middle English, and this old form quickly died out, giving way to this newer version. The English language has undergone a lot of transformation over many years, so I wonder if you'll see another transition in this language in the future. At number 5, Coptic. When you think of the ancient Egyptian language, you would probably imagine the hieroglyphs that these ancient people were known for. Coptic was actually the final stage of the ancient Egyptian language before it was replaced with Arabic, and it was written using the Greek alphabet. Coptic was also considered to be the first ever Christian language. It was created as a result of four different languages, those being Greek, Demotic, Hieratic, and the Hieroglyphs. For some time, Coptic was preserved as a religious language, but it died out after about 300 years. There are no languages out there that are even close to Coptic, making this one very unique. At number 4, Ayapaneco. Now this next language isn't exactly extinct, but it is severely endangered because there's only a small handful of people left in the world who still speak it. Ayapaneco is a critically endangered language that originated in Tabasco, Mexico. From what I understand, there are only two native speakers of this language left, but the issue is that those two people refuse to speak to each other and no one knows why, which is a bit mysterious. People say that they just don't get along, but again, the reason for that is unknown. The reason that this language has pretty much died off is because of the severe lack of native speakers. This is all thanks to 20th century Spanish educational reform, where children were forced to not speak in any other languages other than those which were approved. It's so sad that this language has pretty much gone all because of outsider influence. At number 3, Aramaic. This next language is pretty special because it's one that is said to have been spoken by Jesus Christ himself. The Aramaic language was, in its heyday, the primary language because it was so widely used. This language is also the one that replaced the highly complex Akkadian language, which we will talk about in a few moments. There are Aramaic speakers, but none of them actually came from the country which this language originated. This dead language came from Aram, but the country fell to the Assyrians back in ancient times. However, despite the destruction of Aram, their language remained fairly intact as the Assyrians used it as a second language given its significance and popularity since it was the lingua franca of the Middle East. The reason that this language eventually died out was due to the diaspora of the people who spoke it. There was a point where some researchers feared that the language would be gone by the next century. However, thanks to the historical significance of the language, as well as the texts that still need to be researched in its language, Aramaic still remains preserved, unused but not completely lost. At number 2, Old Norse. Now let's talk about the language that was used by one of the most interesting civilizations from the past. We all know about the Vikings. 
We've done a few videos about them on this channel so far, but no one has really talked about how they spoke, so let's get into it. The Vikings spoke Old Norse. It was unique to the Vikings, but it ultimately died off in a similar way to the Aramic language. As the Vikings split off and became individual groups like Icelandic, Norwegian, Swedish, Danish, and Faroes, the language kind of just faded away over time. Though the entirety of Old Norse has been lost for the most part, some remnants still remain in the English language. Since both Old Norse and English stem from the Germanic family, they share similarities and this is how we got words like cake, knife, and berserk. They came from the Vikings. On top of that, the word Thursday came from the Vikings Thor's Day, as in the god, and the word husband came from Old Norse as well as it was a mashup of the words hus and bondi. And finally, at number one, Akkadian. The ancient language Akkadian originated in Akkad, an old Mesopotamian city from ancient times. This language was actually the first certified Semitic language in history. If you learned about Mesopotamia, then you would probably be familiar with its written form of the language called cuneiform. Akkadian was spoken by the likes of Mesopotamians, Babylonians, and Chaldeans. But unfortunately, due to the language's inability to evolve, it ultimately died out, as I mentioned when talking about Aramic, since that language was the one to replace Akkadian. This language is very much dead, unless you want to learn cuneiform, which in that case, you'd have to learn Akkadian as well. Number 10, capture over choice. Consent is my favorite word. It really is, because it's important. But back in ancient times, wasn't really a word anyone really understood. Thousands of years ago, couples skipped right over dating and instead went from captured to married. In fact, it was this idea that kind of sparked the origin of the honeymoon. A bride would be captured from a tribe, the tribe would go looking for her, and the thief would hide her away until they stopped. If you have watched the Spartan video on Bumblebee, if you haven't, go check it out, then you may know that their marriage ceremony centered on this as well, kind of, sorta, of, but it was, but consent was involved. As a way of courting, the women would wrestle to demonstrate their physical prowess and vice versa. They would watch the men as well and they would kind of simultaneously be like, yep, you. Then the woman's head would be shorn, they would dress them as a boy, and then they would be placed in a dark room and then wait for their betrothed to capture them and take them away. So very confusing there. I don't really understand it. But anyways, let's move on. Number nine, love letters. So nice. Today, it's easy to send a saucy text and an explicit pic to your partner or fling, or a person you're just friends with, but you know. Or the person you've been seeing for like half a year, but they're not your BF or GF, like no. Anyways, the rules are up in the air. But back then, you had to wait with bated breath to receive a thought out letter from your lover, filled with poetry and extravagant flirtations and little drawings. There are love notes between Anne Boleyn and Henry VIII. Henry even drew little doodles of a man depicted in lovesick sorrows. Anne then wrote back with drawings showing her talking to the angel Gabriel, being like, oh yeah, I'm gonna get a son. The Tudor version of the emoji. One of their exchanges went, and I quote, If you remember my love and your prayers as strongly as I adore you, I shall scarcely be forgotten, for I am yours, Henry Rex forever. And then Anne's response was, Be daily prove you shall me find, to be to you both loving and kind. And then he cut her head off. How quickly the milk turned sour. But it was the way to play back then, and soon you'd have stacks of letters with declarations of love as you're heading to the chopping block with the guy beside you. Awful way to go. Awful way to go. Henry, you suck. Number eight, escort cards. Today, someone might ask you for you to give them your number so they can text you, you up at like 3 a.m. No, you're not. You're asleep because you have to work the next day. If you lived in the Victorian era, you may have dropped a calling card instead, or an escort card. Want to go on a date? Here's my card. It doesn't sound so romantic, but social calling cards didn't have your usual brick printing and beige background. Social calling cards were lavish, enticing, elegant, with bright colors and lush paper. If a man wanted to court a woman, he would hand her his calling card, which would not only include his name, but compliments to her. Kind of 
like a Valentine's Day card but every day of the year. If a woman was the bee's knees and she was unmarried, she'd often return home with stacks of them. If she was particularly fond of one of them, she might take up the offer presented with the card, the offer of escorting a woman to and from a future social gathering. She would send her servant to deliver the news with her own calling card in response. This process was repeated several times and either amounted to something steady or flittered out. We all know what a ghosted text feels like, so I imagine this would be kind of the same. Number 7. Knives Huh? If someone ever hands you a knife outside of lending it to you to eat your lunch, be wary, they may be trying to court you. In some Nordic countries, some courtship rituals involved knives. In Finland, for example, when a girl came of age to start courting, her father would give her an empty sheath to wear. It would be attached to her girdle, and when a suitor liked her, he would put his knife in her sheath. <laughs> <laughs> if the girl was interested, she would keep it. If not, she would give it back. <laughs> Good old nonverbal communication. No. But also imagine putting a knife into the hand of someone you just denied. Ooh. If she kept it, this was also a signal to other suitors that she was taken and not interested in pursuing others. The idea of giving a woman a token of affection that she could use to signal her own interests is seen in many cultures such as… What's next? Number 6. Spoons. We talked about knives that fit their sheaths, now let's talk about spoons. Spoons? Dating back all the way to 17th century Wales, suitors would give ornately carved love spoons. They would make it from a single piece of wood to show his affection to his intended. On the spoon, there would be engravings which would symbolize intention, i.e. an anchor for instance would mean I desire to settle down, and the vine would mean something like love grows. Rural peasants used wooden spoons to eat and prepare food, so carving spoons to use every day was a usual chore. The most beautiful spoons were kept therefore to keep as gifts, to give to those you loved or wanted to. The better the spoon, the finer the details, the finer the craftsman, the better the husband, which signaled to the love interest that they were reliable and skilled. The tradition is not specifically unique to Wales, in fact it happened in many Celtic countries. Number 5. Dating and Dangerous so fun fact, after the Victorian era, or and slash kind of during, going on dates was uh scandalous, like pretty kind of oof. The term date is a relatively new term. It was coined just before the turn of the century. George Ad wrote in the Chicago Record about young women filling up the dates in their calendar with rendezvous with young men and that was in 1896. In the 1900s it took a little bit of adjusting. This therefore set the term kind of date as women going on dates. In the 1900s this took a little bit of adjusting. A woman out alone with a man without a chaperone at night and not a courtesan? How scandalous! As more and more women started doing it, people weren't sure how to react. Law enforcement even got involved because they would see a woman alone with a man and be like, she's a woman of the night and then they'd arrest her or they would be confused. But either way, in the eyes of the law, dating kind of became a crime. Women making a date seemed like they were pulling something else, so sometimes it was illegal to date, though other times it was like, dude, just Stop, we're trying to go get dinner. Leave us alone. Number four, the art of the fan. Ooh. Being entirely open about who you were pursuing could raise a lot of eyebrows and damage one's reputation. So nobles often had to code their advances behind the art of the fan, mostly women, actually all women. If you have ever seen Dangerous Liaisons, you may have noticed Glenn Close elegantly using her fan to seduce and manipulate gentlemen callers around her finger. And that really how it was. It was all a game only the cleverest suitors could decode. Carrying it in the right hand in front of your face? Follow me. Placing it on the left ear? I wish to get rid of you. With the handle to the lips? Kiss me. A society lady in the 18th century was expected to know how to elegantly handle and hold a fan. This also helped differentiate between social classes. So not only was it used to set up a secret meeting in the garden with your betrothed lover, it was also used to communicate gossip and information. Number 3. Classified ads 
Today we have so many dating apps, it's dizzying. You can swipe left, you can swipe right for your dream beau, any which way you like, Hinge, Tinder, Bumble, is that all there is? Plenty of fish, I don't know. It may surprise you to learn that this wasn't the first time people tried it this way. Enter classified ads. Uh, or personalized ads. If you were desperate for love and knew your person was out there, but you just hadn't run into them yet, you would make an ad. In 1722, a Bostonian took space in the New England Current to put out an ad for, and I quote, any young gentlewoman that is minded to dispose of herself in marriage to a well accomplished young widower and has five or six hundred pounds to secure to him by deed of gift, she may repair to the sign of the glass lanthorn in Steeple Square to find find all the encouragement she can reasonably desire." And unquote. It was written by a 16 year old Benjamin Franklin. Oh bless. Some would even put out ads that captured the attention of someone they saw in passing. Take for instance this 1748 printing calling for, and I quote, a lady genteelly dressed. This is to acquaint her that if she is disengaged and inclinable to marry a gentleman who was on that occasion is desirous of making honorable proposals. <laughs> so cute. And now we know that all those dating apps were just a matter of time. Number two, bedding ceremonies. Okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't think of anything I would like least in the world uh, than to have an entire room full of guests during one of those private moments in anyone's life especially my parents. Ugh. Now, first comes dating, or courting, as it were. Then comes marriage, slash sometimes they would just skip over dating and just go right to an arranged marriage, especially if you were a noble. And then for a long time, comes your aunts, uncles, and parents into the bedding chamber to watch the consummation. Yay. A crowd of people would be there up until the very last second when the curtains were drawn, cheering you on. <laughs> Someone even like offer advice, like don't do that, do this. Some even stayed well past. For instance, on the wedding night of the young King Louis XIII and Anne of Austria, they had two nurses in attendance to make sure the ordeal went down. But this wasn't just in Europe, this also happened in China in the early 1900s. Number one, bundling. Probably one of the most awkward ceremonies ever to take place, As, except for that one. That's the worst. But this is specifically to do with before getting married. As we have gathered thus far, being young and in love, or just being in love in general, has never been too easy. Bundling was a way to make it easier, I guess. I don't know. This 17th century tradition involved having your beau invited over, the parents needed to approve it, of course, and then you were to spend the night sleeping next to each other bundled up to the neck or sometimes just the waist like in like a human sack and then you would sleep next to each other with a plank of wood in the middle. So romantic. The tradition was meant as a way to gauge chemistry between the two lovebirds. The two would get to know each other by talking and sleeping together only before engaging in marriage. If it didn't go well, then they wouldn't get married. If it did go well, so much so that they unwrapped each other like Christmas presents on Christmas morning, then they pretty much got married like as soon as possible. The tradition was pretty popular in Ireland, the rural United Kingdom, and the New England colonies from 16th century into the 18th, but a lot of Victorian ideals were completely against it. They were like, no, corset it up and no love. Number 10, plastic surgery. Some celebrities you think are immortal when really it's just their plastic surgery that's fooling you. Unless you're Paul Rudd, he's definitely immortal. Sometimes it's obvious who's had it done and sometimes it's really obvious who's gotten it done. Coming from the Greek term plastikos, which means to mold or to form, the oldest known plastic surgery took place in ancient Egyptian days. There's a medical text from the ancient Egyptian days that was named after the American Egyptologist who got it in 1862 and in it contains these ancient procedures. They look a little bit different from the shows we see today. You know, where it's like all these medical, we're gonna take this thing and put it into this guy's head. And you're like, how did they do that? This was a lot different. This is ancient procedures we're talking about. What procedure back then was to fix nasal injuries? This method used wooden splints, lint, swabs, and the first ever nose job was done. Even in 2000, a mummy was found with a prosthetic toe. So they asked volunteers to try walking with it to determine if it was created for purpose or for style. 
That's, that's nice. Here, try on this mummy's toe. Take a lap, see how you feel. Are you cursed? Plastic surgery in the sense of reconstruction, that first account comes from India in the sixth century. The Indian physician Sashruta Shamita is considered the father of plastic surgery. His patients were more interested in the cosmetic side effects, whereas the Egyptian practices were to fix the nose. Now around 500 BC, reconstructive surgery was done in India as well to reform noses that were cut off as a punishment. Number nine, broken bones. Sometimes a bone breaks and it needs immediate medical attention. Maybe a bone is pushing into a vital organ, maybe it's healing the wrong way, or maybe it's just a toe and you can't do anything about it but hobble around the house all day and learn new curse words as you mumble them and hobble. We all had that one friend in school who always had a cast on or that blue finger restraint. There's always the one kid. But what happens if you broke your arm in the 1300s? Then what? Well, you wouldn't get any cool signatures from your cool friends, but what would happen is that they would use these blocks of wood and cloth and just wrap everything around completely tight. Just the biggest cast possible. You actually could sign your name on this thing as many times as you wanted. I take that back. This thing was, you pretty much had a coffin around your leg, more or less. Number eight, trepanation. One of history's oldest surgeries, trepanation was the worst, that's for sure. To this day, we're not even sure why this was a thing, but we picked up a few ideas along the way. Turning the clocks back thousands of years, trepanation was the practice of drilling holes into your skull. A popular theory here is that trepanation was done to release evil spirits. Yeah, let's just drill holes into our skull and see if our mental illness just goes away. As barbaric as this sounds, skulls found in Peru hint that this procedure wasn't as fatal as you would think. The reason that this would happen was also to clear out bone fragments after skull fractures. So you'd show up with a headache and then you'd leave with a hole in your head. But honestly, the fact that you're leaving at all is pretty surprising. They obviously didn't have advanced medical instruments. They would use any sharp instruments they could find, like rocks, flint, it was pretty rough. This was the first surgical procedure around 6,500 BC. The term trepanation comes from the Greek term trepanon, which means means a borer to, you know, to drill essentially. Number seven, tooth extraction. You may not think of surgery when you talk about tooth extractions or whatever, but this for sure counts as surgery. Every time something gets removed from your body and there's blood, I'm gonna count that, sorry. I had to get a tooth pulled a few years ago and I'm still haunted by it. It is so barbaric the way they do it. They don't slice a line and then gently slide the tooth out. No, they had two dentists just grab my tooth at the same time, put their foot up and then just yank my tooth out. Not, like that was, the, we're still there, really? Back in the day, pulling teeth was done not to make room for braces, but to solve any problem at all regarding your teeth. Cavity, gone. Toothache, see you later, tooth. Back in 5000 BC, a Sumerian paper referred to dental worms. So the earliest account of tooth decay, we think. Unless they were actual dental worms, in which case, gross. But no, it was, you had a cavity. We're lucky to have x-rays and modern technology tell us now if the tooth's coming in sideways. But back then, some believed it was always tooth worms, no matter what. If it hurts, yeah, it's worms, get them out. Imagine pulling your tooth out and being like, didn't find any worms. Aristotle and Hippocrates wrote about dentistry in 500 BC, and the way that they would handle tooth decay or extraction was by using metal wires to fix wobbly teeth or even a broken jaw. So it was pretty horrible. If you go to the dentist now, just when you sit back and relax, you're sitting back and you're relaxing. That's it. The rest sucks, but these guys would stand up and just get the yang. Number six, blood transfusion. Back around 70 AD, the Romans were pretty wild when it came to the Colosseum and the games that would go down. There was lots of bloodshed, of course. There's animals and warriors and a lot of stabby stabbies. And crowds would rush the arena after the day was done, not to get autographs, but to hopefully get a sweet sip of that gladiator blood. Yeah, blood was considered a magical elixir back then. And then near the early 1500s, blood was then seen as youth juice. Yeah, if you drink some young blood as an elderly, those knees would just magically come back. Apparently, don't drink blood if you're watching this. Don't, unless you're Edward Cullen, don't drink blood. Team Jacob. Lots of theories surrounding blood in the Middle Ages. Bloodletting was a go-to when you were sick because they thought that your humors were out of balance. It was like, oh, you're sick? You just got some weird blood, we'll, we'll just drain you out a bit. Vampires, all vampires. In 1628, blood circulation was discovered by a man named William Harvey, and that just absolutely changed the game. Now the idea of something going into your bloodstream was in the picture, hypothetically. So we started to test this out on canines, of course. Scientists were injecting them with different substances, and slowly but surely that turned into blood transfusion between canines. So this is back in the 1660s. That's how early we started injecting things. Number five, 
mummification. Mummification was common. Even today we're finding more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history. But how the hell was mummification done back then? How was it done so well? We're talking about teeth worms and trepanation. How did ancient Egyptians figure this out? And how was it done in a way where the bodies are still reserved this long? Well, it wasn't cheap, I'll tell you that for free. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is basically, you get a hook in your nose and all your brains would be pulled out. And then, they would cut the left side of your stomach, remove all those goods, all the organs, just bleh, gone, let those dry, yuck. And then you put the heart back in the body and then you wash the insides out with wine and spices over and over again, until eventually you cover the body in salt for 70 days, and around day 40, you gotta stuff it with sand. Come day 70, that's when you can wrap them in those mummy bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits you, and so does the rest of your life. The jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber with the sarcophagus. So it was just a big room of yuck. Number four, cataract surgery. My brother was born with a cataract. This one's for you, homie. Cataract surgery is one of the oldest surgeries in the book. Well, rather, in the painting. Found in a tomb in ancient Egypt was a painting of what is surely the oldest recorded eye surgery. Scientists are able to make this conclusion due to the length of the tool that the doctor is holding. A little metal rod going into their eye. Just doing this makes me cringe. They believe this was a method called couching. This happened to be recorded. The needle would push the cloudy lens to the bottom of the eye, ideally fixing their vision. The oldest tools found in Egypt tell us that 4,000 years ago, this was the first time that it had been done. But afterwards, evidence of couching was found all over the world. So they kind of were the OG couchers. It wasn't until 1747, until a doctor in France named Jacques Daviel, he performed the first cataract extraction surgery in a modern sense. Every method, older, ancient, modern, it all sounds wildly uncomfortable. If you've been through this, kudos to you. Hit that like button, glad your eyes and stuff are working. Number three, transplantation. Blood transfusion is one thing, but how the hell do we figure out transplants? This arm, now over there on that guy? Hmm? The first successful one was in 1954 in Boston at the Peter Benton Brigham Hospital. That was like a surgical procedure. The first successful one, by any means, came from around 1000 BC. An Indian surgeon, Samhita, had written down details on how to transplant tissue from one of the body areas to repair nose injuries. I mentioned that a little bit earlier. But later on in the 16th century, that idea was revised. In Renaissance Italy in the 16th century, a man named Gasparo Tagliacozzi, and finally, French surgeon Alexis Carroll changed the medical game again in 1902 they published their work on the new techniques using new studies on animals and blood vessels and to this day that technique is still used. In 1904 they partnered with Charles Guthrie in Chicago and performed the first successful animal transplant saving the dog's life. So not that long ago, weirdly enough, had to include it. Number two, open heart surgery. We've discussed ancient Egyptians and how they would clean out the entire body and put the heart back in. Now of course they weren't alive during any of this, that body is long gone. But when was the first open heart surgery? When did the impossible become a reality? Well, the first successful open heart surgery went down in Chicago in 1893. The patient was a man named James Cornish. He got a knife wound to the chest during a brawl. Now the surgeon, Dr. Daniel Hale Williams, who by the way used to be a shoemaker's assistant, saved this man. In the city's first interracial hospital too. Lots of firsts happening in this one. There we go. There weren't any textbooks on this type of operation at the time, so the odds of survival were low. In fact, there weren't any odds at all at this point. There were no x-rays, antibiotics, anesthesia, but also, there was no problem. Apparently, using just a scalpel, Dr. Williams cut through his chest, weaved through the nerves, muscles, ribs, everything important, until eventually he closed a severed artery near the heart. Cornish survived, and come 1894, Williams was promoted to chief surgeon at the Freedman's Hospital in Washington, D.C. Coming at number one, stitches. I'm gonna to totally jinx myself after this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. I'm on a high alert now at all times. 27, not too bad. Many of my friends though, they've gotten stitches in their life. It's pretty common at this point. So I figured I'd cap this list off by going back to the origins of stitches. Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, stitches were first made from plants, like hemp or cotton, or even animal tendons or animal arteries. Cat gut was the most common. That was a thread made of sheep intestines. One of the craziest ways of closing a wound was by using ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants or army ants, they would be held against the opening, and then you wait for it to bite down, and once it does so, you would then remove the body, cut the head off, so the head of the ant is still stuck biting onto your cut, staying there until it heals. Imagine Ant-Man showing up to save the day and he just throws a pocket full of army ants. He's like, I'm here, I'm here to save you all. He just shows up, whips all the ants. He's like, there you go, you're healed. They're like, we didn't expect this at all. Please send somebody else, Ant-Man. Psh, grow. Number 10, not so friendly fire. What happens when you mix an Ottoman invasion, alcohol, and gunpowder? I'm not sure, but I imagine it's pretty bad. 
just like the Battle of Karensbys, where embarrassingly enough the Austrian army fired upon itself. Now, looking up military history will tell you that friendly fire incidents are more common than you might think. I'm looking at you, Vietnam War, but this incident is a little more unique as it may have started over a bottle of booze. A group of soldiers procured some alcohol and was enjoying the joys of liquid courage. After getting too boisterous, more Austrians wanted to join in. Not wanting to share their boozy finds and feelings, a fight broke out. The Austrian army was composed of multiple nations, so there were a few different languages being spoken. And by that, I mean a very confusing fight broke out. Eventually, someone fired a shot, someone shouted Turks, and a very embarrassing battle ensued. By the end, it's speculated that 10,000 Austrians were unalived during this boozy mistake. That's, hey. Hey, happens. Mistakes are made, happens. Number 9. History's Second Favorite Mustache When we talk about history, it's really hard not to talk about Germany and a little man with a weird mustache. World War II is the cause and effect for a lot of reasons and things today. That too could honestly be its own video, but what's rather uncommon to talk about in history's classrooms is history's second favorite mustache man rhymes with Sosef Jalin. The battles between Germany and the Soviet Union during World War II were some of the worst, Stalingrad having the most casualties than any other battle during the war. The Soviet Union would fight back its invaders, but when they were pushing into the heart of Germany, it wasn't so much as liberating as oppressing. oppressing. The comrade in chief is known for targeting ethnic groups with starvation and having a tight grip on the Soviet people by threatening them with gulags. Harsh and brutal labor camps where anyone who opposed his regime would be worked to death in conditions that harsh and brutal simply don't cover. Historians believe his regime was responsible for the deaths of 20 million people, which is almost double the amount of his German doppelganger. Not cool. Number 8. Abandoned by the world 1930s Germany wasn't a great place to be if you were Jewish. Matter of fact, anywhere near Germany was a bad time for Jewish people. Some people saw the writing on the wall and it was clear. Anyone lighting a menorah during the holiday season needed to leave Europe and set sail for more liberal waters. In 1939, a vessel called the St. Louis arrived in North American waters, searching for freedom and to escape persecution persecution that would likely lead to their deaths. This is an unfortunate black spot in western democracies. As for the weary travelers, finding someone who would take them in was proving difficult. They tried Cuba, but were refused all but a handful. Then the US, same thing happened. They even tried glorious Canada, where they too refused them. Canada, a country of freedom and acceptance for all, turned down people in their darkest hour. Sadly, the boat returned to Europe where they met the same fate as other Jews who were oppressed by the regime. Number 7. Civil Rights I know a lot of these are World War II related, but, but bear with me guys. It had a lot of uncomfortable moments. Some that should be talked about. Acknowledging and apologizing for mistakes of the past is a sure way to have a brighter future. During World War II, there was something called the Germany First policy, meaning a lot of effort was made to defeat Germany first, but Imperial Japan was just as much as a threat. Apparently so much so that President Roosevelt wanted to put Japanese Americans in something called relocation camps. Thousands of Japanese Americans and Japanese Canadians, cause oh yeah, we did it too, were taken from their homes and relocated to camps in order to prevent a second Pearl Harbor. You don't need an HR manager to tell you what an egregious act this is against civil rights. While they were not like the camps found in Europe, it's yet another dark splotch on two countries who boast about their freedoms and democracy. The camps were closed shortly after the war had ended. Number 6. Moving Forward Together European settlers were not very nice to Indian tribes. That's probably no surprise to anyone, but what might be unknown to some is Canada's treatment of First Nations peoples. More specifically, residential schools, a system supported by the church and Canadian government to indoctrinate and assimilate First Nations children into European North American culture. Children were forcibly taken from their homes and were forced to learn against their own beliefs, language, and were victims of crimes and physical harm. Sadly for First Nations, this was somewhat effective and did a good job displacing families. The last residential school closed in 1997, which for many is still too recent and a painful reminder of Canada's past. Furthering the horrors of the residential schools was the discovery of unmarked graves in 2021, where hundreds of indigenous children's remains were found, showing that Canada has a long way to go 
We can and will do better. Number 5. Sticky Situation The molasses flood of 1919 sounds like a lot of sweet fun, but it was actually a horrific event. And not just for diabetics, it was uncomfortable for two reasons. Reason number one being that 21 people lost their lives at what must have been the most confusing thing ever to see. A rush of sticky molasses flooded the streets of Boston and caused a crazy amount of damage. Reason number two being, well, how this occurred in the first place. I'll give the folks at home a second to take a guess at how they think it happened. Ready? If you said workplace neglect, congratulations, you went bragging rights. Basically, it was foobar from the start. The large tank that held the sweet stuff wasn't built properly, wasn't properly inspected by professionals. No one really understood, I guess, that fermentation produces gas, which made an already unsafe tank more unsafe. And well, there you go, boom, an unholy sticky flood. Probably one of the biggest lessons in work safety history. And let's be honest, who wants to swim in molasses? You never get out of it. Number four, Broken Arrow. The Cold War wasn't exactly cold, as nuclear weapons had the potential to make it hot. Too hot. So, here's something to make everyone lose a little more sleep at night, because I know everyone at home is stress free right now and gets a full eight hours of sleep. Today, when you lay your wee head to rest on Count Sheep, I want you to think about Broken Arrow. No, not actually a broken arrow, but the broken arrow incident or incidents, which if you didn't know is the code phrase for a nuclear device gun MIA. For example, on July 28th, a US aircraft from Dover Air Force Base, Delaware was carrying three nuclear bombs over the Atlantic Ocean. The plane experienced a loss of power and the crew jettisoned two nuclear bombs into the ocean and they have never been recovered. Wow, that's great. There were at least another dozen broken arrow incidents from the 1950s until the end of the Cold War. Now as bad as that sounds, I mean, it's pretty bad. These are our nukes we're talking about. At least America's lost bombs were recorded. Nobody really knows how many bombs the Soviet Union lost during the Cold War. Gee, now I feel real swell and safe. Number three, Ich bin ein Belena. This may be old news to those of our older audience, but news to younger. And honestly, it's crazy that it even happened in the first place. So World War II ends, right? And the Allies are all super good friends, right? Wrong! Berlin basically gets split into two, Capitalist West and Communist East. So the Cold War kicks off, a very strong disagreement on what political and economical structure is better. As it turns out, life was just better on the West. People in the East just didn't have access to certain things the West did. So people started bailing shit. I don't blame them. So much so that a wall was built dividing the two. This may not sound like much, but it was huge. The Berlin Wall divided families, business, and put on the full display of failure that communism was. As JFK said, democracy is not perfect, but we've never had to put a wall up to keep our people in. And honestly, the guy's right. That's just kind of crazy. Number two, can't beat them, join them. Japan was the new cool kid in school, and by that, I mean they were the most powerful force in Asia in the late 1930s. Japan rapidly adopted westernized ideas, structures, and the old habit of invading foreign nations, and wrecking absolute havoc when there. Specifically, Nanking in 1937. Some historians consider this to be the beginning of World War II, but it's debatable. What's not debatable is the uncomfortable way Imperial Japanese forces treated Chinese civilians. Japan was expanding during the early 20th century, and China was next on the schedule. I'm going to recommend you Google this one at home, as there is so much naughty stuff about Nanking in 1937 that I'd get the censors a headache just thinking about it. There's a really infamous photograph that you probably haven't seen, and it's 100% not safe for work. The invasion of China and incidents like that of Nanking still have sour relations between the two nations today. Number one, the world is yours. Okay, so kind of a broad stroke here, but very fitting. I'm putting everything the British Empire did at the number one spot. I mean, come on, guys, it's the British Empire. Sure, it's no secret what they did, but there's so much to unpack here. It's a lot. Redcoats have been making things uncomfortable since the late 1600s. The American colonies and how they treated Indians, the occupation of actual India, and the opium wars in China, just to name a few. At its height, the British Empire had conquered. 25% of the Earth's land surface. And like I always say, when you get that big, you gotta break a few eggs along the way to make your omelet. What's up? Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. 
I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing. It's not a good Saturday at all. I want to move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. Not just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visine, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Ebers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mix in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription. You're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects, like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history, and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yeah. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the Great Stink. Yeah, the Great Stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up, leaving just 
sewage. Just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I want to know who the first guy was to be like, you know what? Nah, I'm going home. This sucks. This sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They just soak it in chloride to be like, that's better. It's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford. That's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey would get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work. Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. Just some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict? It wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason. Idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. Specifically, the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two, ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays, and let me tell you, Still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now. I'm going to go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. 
Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense as it was cheap and easy to use, so that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with it, I'm sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory. I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> Kicking off the list at number 10, pig toilets. Yeah, we'll start off with a nasty one. Look, we're on the part six now. We're talking about some ancient hygiene practices. It's gonna get gross, it just has to at this point. I've talked about Roman toilets, horsehair dental floss, so now we gotta dive into some yucky stuff. Pig toilets began around 200 BC in China, and these pig toilets were actually pretty common. You would just go to the washroom over top of a pig pen. It's pretty straightforward. It's pretty awful, but also it's all they had. It was pretty awful, but I would say it's worse for the pigs. Definitely worse for the pigs. The pigs would eat the waste because it was mixed into their food. They couldn't tell the difference. Ugh, horrible. This was one of the few options to manage waste, especially in areas where plumbing wasn't possible. I talked about pigs going to court in your recent Bumblebee video. If I was a pig, I would be pressing charges left, right, and center after this. That's so disgusting. We're at number 10 and I want to puke. Nice, buckle up. Number nine, water closets. This one sounds fun, a closet full of water. What a blast, pun intended. Back in the 1800s, all over Europe, our modern day version of the bathroom came to life. Thankfully, I'm, I'm very glad this happened. If it didn't happen, it'd be, it'd be a little bit different nowadays. It takes two things to have a water closet, a home big enough for a room purely devoted to waste, which is amazing, and of course, running water, that definitely helps. Sir John Harrington, godson to Queen Elizabeth I, was determined to invent what we now know as the basic toilet. Back in 1596, he created this idea, and people actually made fun of this guy for spending so much time working on a useless device. Yeah. The more we know. Cut to 200 years later, another inventor by the name of Alexander Cummings reworked the water closet, added an S trap, a little valve between the top and the bottom parts of the bowl, and now we're on the right track. Then a couple years later, in 1777, Samuel Prosser applied for a plunger closet patent and got it. A year later after that, Joseph Brama enters the toilet game, adds a valve on the bottom, an old school ball cock. So we're getting there, slowly over time. Different inventors are bringing their new ideas in, all so that we can go and take a Rodman was a sailor at the time, so his water closet was often used on ships of that era. Today we have toilets that flush automatically. Once you get up or move around, the sensors think you're done, and then they blast away. If you stand and wipe, good game. Things will be making noise all day long. Number eight. Bald face. In another video on things too woke for this era, I talked about how it was once cool to have no hair on your face at all. I can't grow any facial hair, so this is this reaches out to me. This is good. I like this. I like punching out this fact. Well, Queen Elizabeth I was the first to bring this idea into Western culture. She influenced women to completely pluck their eyebrows, and on top of that, they would also shave their hairline back as far as they could, so their faces would be as large and as big and bright as possible. Just right there, like the big moon. Just. It was common for women to soak bandages in a mix of ammonia, vinegar, walnut oil, all to hopefully, hopefully suppress the hair growth on their forehead. Facial hair was removed, but body hair, that was left untouched. The Catholic Church also influenced the look. Growing your hair out was a feminine display until you went out in public and had long hair. Then it was immodest. Because, of course, number seven, loincloths. Okay, I have to adjust the jeans for this one. Going back to ancient Roman and ancient Egyptian times, the loincloth was used by all. Neat. Either that or you would just be naked. So, you know, if you're a nudist, great. Hit the thumbs up if you're a nudist. I don't know. I don't know why I said that. We're gonna keep going. I found this neat step-by-step -step on the internet how to make your own loincloth. And it's a bit more complicated than throwing on sweatshorts and calling it a day. We don't have a lot of archeological evidence today because these linens barely made it through a decade, let alone all this time. But ancient Romans would use leather also to make underwear, which is, just imagine that, I'm like, ha, it's hot. Hot goat skin wrapped around your waist in the sun. We love it. We still use leather today when it comes to undergarments, but we'll save that talk for another time. Number six, breast bags. There's a neat term, breast bags. Let's bring that one back, see if it sticks. Now, contrary to what I just explained over at point number seven, women, more often than not, didn't wear undergarments in the Middle Ages. 
up here at least. But in 2008, Austria's Langburn Castle, something that resembled a modern day bra, was discovered. It's believed that only higher ups, ladies of nobility rather, were the only ones who had the privilege to wear these breast bags or breast cups. I say breast bags, sounds a little funnier. We have bags of milk in Canada, so you know, I'm connecting the, yeah, that's, that's, I gotta connect the jokes. I can't say much personally, but this does not look supportive enough at all. It's like a pirate flag, it's like ripped apart, this is nothing. If you have back problems, I don't think these breast bags are gonna help you. If you're ever catching up on some 13th century readings, well, now you have an image when you see the word breast bag. This, this eye patch that they called support. Number five, cesspools. Ooh, gross transition. If you're gonna make a massive castle, you need to know where to build certain rooms. Like say over a cesspool, for an example, that might be important. Just plug your nose. Cesspools were often placed under floors, which makes sense, cause you know, you, you poop and then gravity and everything goes down. But you need to make sure that those floors are supportive enough. Because in 1183, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire had a dinner in the palace of Erfurt, but the floor in the main hall broke open, resulting in a bunch of dinner guests falling through the floor, with a few of them even drowning in that cesspool. What a horrible way to go. Then again, in 1326 England, Richard the Raker had just sat down for dinner, guy hasn't even started his meal yet, and then again, the floor broke and he fell through and drowned. I'd say chamber pots were safer, definitely, but when it comes to waste, honestly, just out of sight, out of mind. Just get that away from me. Literally, pun intended. Number four, towels. I'm pretty picky when it comes to towels. I always have to have way too many just ready to go at all times. You know, in case I want a bath, in case I want to have two baths in a row, you never know. Today we have nicer towels at hotels than anything, honestly. We all know somebody with a Bahia Principe resort towel in their closet and you're like, really? Really, you thief? Okay, I'm telling. Around the 1800s, flour sack towels were the best you'd get. Now around this time, suppliers were packaging flour and other foods in these cotton sacks. This saved big time on barrels and eventually they were cut into tea towels. Now come the Great Depression, resources were of course limited, so these flour sacks were used now for multiple reasons. Clothing, toys, quilts, pillowcases, diapers, and of course, towels. Wouldn't feel too good on your back, not at all. Number three, same clothes, new day. King James, and no, I don't mean LeBron, I mean King James VI of Scotland this time around. We'll talk about him another time. He had a pretty sweet idea when it came to changing clothes. You don't. Simple as that. What a dream, right? The amount of times I change my shirt every day for literally no reason, it's such a waste of time. It's like black, mm, gray, mm, black. Yeah, that's it. It's a waste of time. King James would wear the same clothes for months at a time, even wearing the same hat for 24 hours straight. Guy's devoted to the hat game. He just slept like, didn't move a muscle. He went as far as not bathing either because he thought that it was bad for his health. Yeah, things were thought differently back then, as you may have known by now on this channel. James became king when he was just 13 months old and he succeeded Mary, Queen of Scots. In 1603, he took over as ruler for both England, Scotland, and Ireland for 22 years. And he looked the same every day. Gotta, gotta love it. Who's committed? Number two, unwanted hair. Pubic hair is a biological mystery, and yes, even after we hit puberty, we still can't figure it out. What are you? What's going on? So far, we believe this is part of our evolutionary history, and it comes from a time where we needed fur all over our bodies, right? Like animals. We evolved to protect ourselves against the cold, and just in general to keep that area, you know, safe. I don't know why I did that sound, but it's safe. So why is it that ancient Greek statues of women are completely hairless? Well, this was a time where if a woman's area was hair free, for some reason, the Greeks symbolized it as being pure. Okay. So in order to be considered pure, you'd have to use razors and creams, pumice stones, methods that were not as smooth as today. What's even more annoying is that men who would grow their body hair out, that was a sign of maturing. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not either of these categories. I can't grow anywhere where I want to. It's just bald, I'm just a bar of soap. Yeah, I'm not gonna use a stone to shave either. Thanks, we'll pass, next. And finally, coming in at number one, acne. Ancient Egyptians and Greeks came up with an interesting method of getting rid of those pimples. Now, reminder, this was long before Dr. Pimple Popper was ever a thing. You ever click one of those videos and you're watching for like 40 minutes? You're like, I'm gonna be sick. Is that yogurt? What is that? Physicians back then discussed these elevated spots with black tops that can plague your skin for four to five years. But by squeezing these mysterious spots, you force out the maggot inside. Yeah, blackheads were called maggots back then, so that's pretty horrible. That's gonna be in my head forever. They would refer to severe cases as maggots that lie in bed of roses, AKA 
your face. That's the bed of roses. If a physician told me I had maggots in my face, I'd faint. Teeth worms and maggots, like just brush your teeth and wash your face and then avoid all that smoke. These disorders were thought to be human skin taken on the properties of animals, so that's pretty wild. So ancient Greeks and Egyptians would use honey, vinegar, turpentine, and emulsion of bitter almonds to solve that problem. Or what I just do is I just squeeze really hard, yell one curse word, and then wipe the mirror. That's usually how I do it. At number 10, treaties of the vessels. I think that most of us love the idea of uncovering some kind of lost treasure. I, for one, would love to pull an Indiana Jones and uncover artifacts lost to the sands of time, but realistically, you need a lot of clues in order to find these things. They could be anywhere. The world is quite a large place, you know. That's why ancient texts and documents are so important to researchers, because sometimes they can give clues as to where some treasures might be. This is sort of the case with the treaties of the vessels. This ancient Hebrew text claims to reveal the location of where the treasures of King Solomon's temple are hidden. Well, sort of. The text discusses the location of the treasures as well as the fate of the Ark of the Covenant, which is a chest that is said to hold tablets engraved with the Ten Commandments. And as you would imagine, these are highly sought after, but no one knows where it is and the treaties of the vessels isn't really much help to researchers. The text says that the location of these things will quote, not be revealed until the day of the coming of the Messiah, son of David. So it just teases us with this mystery. We still have to wait to find these treasures. At number nine, Gospel of the Lots of Mary. Have you ever wished that you could know the future? Maybe you want to know how a relationship would play out, or if you should do something about your career, but you just need that little confirmation of future events to help you along. Well, if you lived in ancient times, then you might have sought out the Gospel of the Lots of Mary to help you with your needs. This ancient text is quite the gospel and dates back to around 1500 years. The Gospel of the Lots of Mary doesn't discuss the life of Jesus Christ, but in instead contains 37 oracles that were written pretty vaguely. The original text was written in Coptic, an Egyptian language, and has been translated in modern times. The book opens with the words, quote, The Gospel of the Lots of Mary, the mother of the Lord Jesus Christ, she to whom Gabriel the archangel brought the good news, he who will go forward with his whole heart will obtain what he seeks, only do not be of two minds. End quote. Researchers believe that this book would have been used for divination in an attempt to seek knowledge of the future. Someone in need of answers would seek out this book, ask a question, and then would have gone through a process that would randomly select one of the 37 oracles to give answers to said person's problem. Almost like how we read horoscopes, but much more mysterious. Before we carry on talking about these strange and mysterious texts, why not leave a big ol' thumbs up on this video if you are thoroughly entertained so far? And while you're at it, why not subscribe to the channel to see more videos like this one and join the hive. At number 8, Librelintius. This next ancient text almost counts as a hidden message because of where this text was found by researchers. The Liber Lintius is an ancient text written in Estrusian, a language that was used in Italy in ancient times. What makes this text so mysterious is the fact that it was found preserved in the wrappings of an Egyptian mummy that dates back around 2200 years. This ancient text's meaning isn't exactly clear, partially because the Etrusian language isn't fully understood, but researchers believe that the written text on the mummy's wrappings are of a ritual calendar. More research is needed to fully decipher this mysterious text, but it's a really cool find nonetheless. At number 7, Gospel of Judas. Guys, we might have quite the plot twist on our hands, and it's all thanks to this mysterious ancient text. Researchers found a 3rd century text that they called the Gospel of Judas, and after being translated, might have revealed an alternate version of an event from the Bible. Originally written in Coptic, the Gospel of Judas seems to be a depiction of Judas Iscariot, the man who betrayed Jesus in the New Testament in a positive light. In the New Testament, Judas was said to have betrayed Jesus by revealing his identity to those who had come to arrest him in exchange for 30 pieces of silver, but in the Gospel of Judas, it describes Jesus as asking Judas to betray him in order for him to be crucified so that he could ascend to heaven. This plot twist is debated among some people though, as other researchers have said that the text actually declares Judas as a demon. Either way, it's a new spin on the story that we didn't have before, and I'd say that's pretty darn mysterious. At number 6, Grolier Codex. Imagine owning something that you believe was just a piece of art, turned out to actually be an ancient 
artifact. This kind of thing is actually a lot more common than you'd think, since over the years, pillaging and looting of ancient sites have led to many artifacts being misplaced and sold around the world. This is the case with the Grolier Codex. The Grolier Codex is an ancient Mayan codex that contains Maya hieroglyphs, illustrations of gods, and a calendar that tracks the movement of Venus. Want to know where they found it? In a club in New York. The person who acquired the codex, a Mexican collector named Jose Sanez, said that he got it from a group of looters in the 1960s, and after a lot of debate, it was found that the codex that he had was in fact authentic. Researchers found that this ancient text was written on paper that dates back about 800 years and was written using paint known as Maya Blue, which actually wasn't synthesized in a lab until pretty recently. I think it's pretty crazy that this ancient text from the Maya civilization somehow ended up in New York and no one really noticed. At number 5, Popol Vuh. Just about every civilization has their interpretation of Earth's origins. Some cultures believe that cosmic beings made the Earth, others believed in various gods and various motivations for creating life. One ancient text that was discovered by researchers tells the story of the Maya and their belief of how the world was created. This ancient text known as Popol Vuh, which ultimately is translated to Book of Counsel, is a mythical origin story. According to the tales written in this ancient text, the forefather gods, quote, brought forth the earth from a watery void and endowed it with animals and plants, end quote. The text also describes how the gods had difficulties making humans and tells the story of how they created two heroes twins who went on a series of adventures and even defeated the Lord of the Underworld. The earliest surviving copy of Popol Vuh dates back to 1701, but it is believed that there were earlier copies of the text that might not have been found or have been lost. At number 4, Copper Scroll. Next up, let's talk about another ancient text that discusses the existence of a large treasure. An ancient Hebrew text called the Copper Scroll was found in a cave in the Judean desert. This ancient text is believed to contain recorded details of a vast treasure that may include gold, silver, vessels, and coins. The Copper Scroll dates back to sometime around 70 CE, which coincides with a time when the Roman army laid siege to Jerusalem and the Second Temple, a Jewish holy temple which stood on the Temple Mount in Jerusalem, was destroyed. Researchers are still unsure if these treasures described in the Copper Scroll actually exist, as it is still highly debated. Even if these treasures really did exist, it could have already been found back in ancient times, but even still, no treasure as large as the one described in the scroll have been found in Israel or Palestine. At number 3, Dresden Codex. For researchers, being able to find ancient texts is very exciting because it can teach them a lot about a civilization, its people, and their beliefs. However, they're often pretty hard to come by due to a number of reasons like poor preservation, warfare, looting, and more. In the case of the Mayans, many of their artifacts and written documents were believed to have been destroyed by Christian missionaries trying to wipe out any non-Christian beliefs, so when one of their ancient texts is found, it's a pretty big deal. When the Dresden Codex was found, it was a huge accomplishment for researchers. The Dresden Codex is an ancient Mayan document that dates back 800 years and contains 39 sheets of text with beautifully drawn images and text on both sides. Researchers done on this codex indicate that it is a record of the phases of the planet Venus so that the Maya, quote, would be certain that their ceremonial events were being held on the correct day. End quote. The codex first appeared in Germany in 1730, but no one really knows how it got there. At number 2, Voynich Manuscript. Now this next ancient text is pretty mysterious simply because no one can read it. Dun dun dun! That's right, the Voynich Manuscript, a 250 page book containing illustrations of plants, cosmological symbols, and naked ladies is carbon dated to have originated sometime in the 15th century. It also contains unreadable text. This book was first discovered in 1912 by an antique book dealer and since then, the text in the book has yet to have been deciphered. There is speculation amongst researchers that suggests that perhaps the language in this book is a lost language or code or perhaps just gibberish. However, a recent study of the book's language suggests that it does have the hallmarks of a real language. You know what I think the Voynich manuscript is an alien document. Think about it. Aliens came to Earth and they documented what they saw, like native plant species and humans, hence the drawings of women, because come on, how can you not be obsessed with women? Right? And these cosmological symbols found in the book would also be tied to the aliens because of course they're from outer space. But what do you guys think? 
And finally, at number one, Handbook of Ritual Power. Saving the best and most mysterious ancient text for last, we have the Handbook of Ritual Power. This is a 20 page ancient codex that dates back around 1300 years and is written in Coptic. What's so interesting and mysterious about this little book is its contents. Within the 20 pages of this ancient book are magic spells and formulas, including love spells, spells for curing black jaundice, and even instructions on how to perform an exorcism. It's believed that this ancient text may have been written by a group of Sethians, an ancient Christian sect who praised Seth, the third son of Adam and Eve. What adds to the already mysterious contents of the book is the book's opening, as it references a mysterious unknown figure named Bactiotha. A translation of the opening text of the handbook reads, quote, I give thanks to you and I call upon you the Bactiotha, the great one who is very trustworthy, the one who is lord over the forty and the nine kinds of serpents. End quote. The book is now housed in a museum in Sydney after they purchased it from an antiquities dealer in Vienna. How this dealer acquired the book though remains unknown. Number 10, New Year's Traditions. Looking over to Lancastrian folklore back in 1872, there was a New Year's tradition, I figured since it's close to that time of the year, might as well throw it in, kick off the list. To celebrate another lap around the sun, your fortune was also revealed. What a lovely combo. If you want to know what kind of partner you're going to end up marrying, well, this superstition might help. It tells you to pour some molten lead into a glass of water, and whatever form those drops assume in the glass, that's going to hint towards your future partner's occupation. So if you see something resembling scissors or whatever, you might just end up marrying a tailor. I mean the profession, not, not this. Now of course, it was never clear what it meant if it was a blob. Of course, a lot of the time the shape was whatever you just wanted it to be, that was the whole fun of it. But obviously now we don't recommend pouring molten lead anywhere in the house. Just champagne. Number 9. Daylight Motion Pictures when the lights dim right before a movie starts, I get so pumped. I don't just mute my phone, I turn that thing off. Hell, sometimes I'll leave it in the car, I don't want anything to do with it. Movie theaters are an event. I don't care if we have seats ahead of time also, we're showing up early. That's just how it is. Daylight motion pictures were a thing back in the 1910s. It was basically a movie theater where the lights are all the way up the entire time. I have a hard enough time watching an after credit scene while people are moving around, let alone an entire movie while the room is fully illuminated. It's like watching a movie like this, surrounded by lights. I can barely do this, let alone watch a movie. That's crazy. But back then, people hated dark auditoriums for many reasons. They did this as well to avoid eye fatigue. That's what happens when your movie is so boring, you just fall asleep. This trend moved across the country and a bill was later passed so theaters had to be sufficiently lit, lit enough so that you can at least see who's next to you. And next up, there were complaints about movie quality, but at that point, historically, women were starting to feel safe enough to sit in dark theaters, so thankfully, they were allowed to dim the lights after. I'm glad they didn't stick around though, I can't even have a lamp on when I watch a movie, let alone all the lights. Number 8, the arrow remover. Ah yes, finally, just the thing that I need to remove this arrow from my knee, it's about damn time. This device will surely solve that problem. That problem back in the 1500s, I mean. Patients back then were more often than not walking in with an arrow sticking out of them, either their chest, their arm, their back, anything horrible. Now instead of cutting the tip off and then pulling it out the opposite way, the arrow remover would just cut into the injury furthermore and then open it even wider. Then it would hold it open and then at that point you would pull the entire arrow with the head back out through your leg or chest or whatever happened. They would open it up and pull it out instead of just snipping it and doing that. Sounds awful, right? Yeah, let's never do that again. Number seven, electrified water. Never put anything electric near water. I'm just gonna start by saying that right off the bat. If you didn't know that, here you go. Thumbs up for knowledge. Health and safety McWatters, so let's do it. Just doing my part. In the early 1900s, electrified water was said to help cure hangovers. If you dipped your hands in it, of course. You don't drink it, you just gotta. And then all of a sudden, you're hydrated. Somehow. If anything, this was just a waste of time and money. The charge stopped well before you'd come in contact with it, and also it didn't wash your clothes without soap. That was also a big rumor with electrified water. It would just somehow wash your clothes and get those stains out. Magic. I'd say we're getting better as a community, but considering gamers are selling bath water online, I, I don't know. It kind of feels like we're going backwards, really. We'll see. Number six, dangerous toys. You'll shoot your eye out, kid. We've all heard that one. Historically, toys have been pretty bad. I mean, moon shoes? Sorry, what? Remember those? You couldn't jump into a treehouse easily. You just rolled your ankle trying to get down the porch steps. It wasn't fun at all. It was just nonsense. Also, way too expensive. But nothing was as bad in history as the Gilbert U-238 Atomic Energy Lab toy set. Yeah, that even sounds horrible, you know what I mean? Upon first glance, it looks interesting, I guess, but when the company released this kit back in 1950, it was all but games. Gilbert, who is a successful toy maker, businessman, even magician, believed that his line of work should be fun, yet 
informative. He was nicknamed the man who saved Christmas after he convinced the US Council of National Defense to not ban toy purchases during World War I. He was a big deal, and so was this toy. The main reason that it'd been discontinued down the road, believe it or not, was because they were too expensive. This set was around $50, which back in the day was a lot more. The price was justified as the set was actually radioactive. The Atomic Energy Lab contained this cloud chamber where you can actually see alpha particles traveling at 12,000 miles a second. Imagine asking for a light bright and then you open this up. And you're like, sorry, what? I can't even read this. What is this? Number five, elephant in the room. Execution by elephant is described as, well, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's loud, it's fast, and it sucks. This method of capital punishment is one of the worst because it involves elephants. And you know, those peanut eaters, they sadly never forget anything. It's a lot of trauma. The elephants would be used, as you would imagine, to crush, dismember, or just injure the victim in any way. The method was most commonly used by royalty because it was a way they could use elephants to signify both the power of the ruler as well as their ability to control a wild animal. His practice began to die out luckily in the 18th and 19th century as parts of the world that used this method began to be colonized. Elephants were the chosen animal in this situation because, well, obviously size matters when picking an animal to inflict pain, but also because of their intelligence. I mean, sure, bears and lions were popular in other parts of the world, so they did some damage too, don't get me wrong, but elephants would be trained to execute the person in a variety of different ways because they're so smart. This is all bad. I think this was normal stuff once. It's horrible. Number four, artificial leeches. What if you don't have a plethora of leeches to choose from? What if you need to let some blood out, but you don't have a barrel full of leeches? Now what are we supposed to do? Well, back in the 1800s, this metal cylinder with blades came to save the day. This was the solution. Yeah, the rotating blades dug into your skin while the metal cylinder sucked your blood out. It's kind of like a pepper shaker, only absolutely horrible. I would say when right away. I'd be like, please stop. Just stop doing that. I'm good. Bring me a thousand leeches instead. I'll take that any day over this saw contraption. Number three, amputation saw. When thinking back to some of these early methods of removing something from the body, it got pretty ugly most of the time. Amputation saws were a tool that doctors would take pride in. These looked like they were from the movie Saw. They were like decorative, they had swirls, these lovely grooves, dare I say, which in hindsight didn't help with germs at all. The last thing I want is a place for them to hide. And secondly, imagine you have to get something amputated and the doctor pulls out the family heirloom amputation saw. Little inappropriate. I love the teal and steel combo, but I'm gonna go to sleep now, thanks. Number two, syringes. You're probably thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, we still use syringes today. We don't wanna leave that in the past. What, what are you talking about? How is this on the list? Syringes used to be massive, comedically large. I can't do needles or like tattoos as a 27 year old, let alone one of these things. No, I'm sorry, I'm good, I fold. In the 1500s, these were used to inject mercury as a treatment for syphilis. It was highly contracted at that point by sailors. And if needles aren't your thing, well, fear not. These actually wouldn't be injected into your skin at all. No, instead it was much worse. The syringe was a urethral one. So it went into the tip of your, yeah, you know what I mean? wasn't pleasant. Sadly, the mercury would take out the subject before syphilis did, so this was all bad. We'll leave this in the past. And finally, coming in at number one, mummification. Once a normal everyday thing, kind of, mummification was quite advanced. Back in the 1300s, mummification was common, and even today we're continuing to find even more mummies. We're uncovering more ancient history by the decade. It's fascinating, but the more we think about it, the more we ask, how the hell was it done? And how the hell was it done so well? Well, we don't do it today because it takes a long, long time. And now, thankfully, we have cleaner methods to rest the dead. It wasn't cheap back then either. Being mummified was reserved for the rich. It's pretty brutal, but what you would do is you'd put a hook up your nose after you were dead, of course, and you would pull all of your brains out. Sounds awful, we're just beginning. After that, they would then cut the left side of the stomach, remove all those goods, organs, everything in ya, just gone right out. The timely process here is letting those organs dry. And while that's happening, you'd be gathering your finest mason jars for your lungs and the liver, of course. And then you put the heart back in the body after washing the insides out with wine and spices. Then you'd cover the body in salt for 70 days and then wrap them in bandages. Then the sarcophagus awaits. Now the jars of organs were also stored in the burial chamber at the end of the day just for fun. Starting off with S for secrets. Alrighty, so here is from the Polish Constitution Day celebration in Chicago, specifically the one from 1978. On the left there, all washed out and crappy old flash display style is First Lady Rosalind Carter. The guy shaking her hand, or rather just holding it and staring off camera like a waiter just went by with a tray of warm sausage rolls he wants to really get into, is John Wayne Gacy. And if you're also thinking, yo, what is up with this guy being in so many 
random famous photos. You're absolutely right, and it's genuinely strange how photographed and out there Gacy was. By the time this was taken, he had already killed over 20 people. Also, when he wasn't side hustling as a clown, he was super active in the government and politics. Thus why wearing the S on the lapel. It was given to him by the Secret Service to indicate special security clearance. So the S literally does stand for secrets. Both the US government and his own. Whose secrets are worse though, huh? Huh? Anyways, at the bottom of the handshake photo, you can see the handwritten address to John Gacy, best wishes, Rosalind Carter. I've heard beauty is pain, but I haven't heard beauty is the next Saw movie? Check out the beauty calibrator. Seeing pictures, you may think it's some sort of middle ages torture machine, or as said, literally one of those Saw movie head devices. But surprisingly not, it's another way to point out women's insecurities and find the smallest things possible to make them feel bad over. Meet the Max Factor beauty calibration machine. It is the only one in existence thank God, and in 1932, the makeup legend Max Factor came up with this ingenious invention combining fearonology, cosmetics, and insecurity gaslighting with pseudoscience analysis of a woman's physical flaws. Max Factor's beauty calibrator enabled Hollywood makeup artists to pinpoint where facial corrections needed to be made down to a literal fraction. The machine, also known in the trades as the beauty micrometer, revealed that a natural perfect face was a myth. Every single woman was imperfect and needed correction, and this machine could find it by taking precise measures. It would mark spots that needed to be fixed and then the artist, once the helmet was removed, could correct all the new insecurities with makeup that you didn't have before you put the stupid thing on. Next up is a photo that's all dramatic flair, the death card. Masseria represented an outdated mindset in the mafia world, one that could no longer be reasoned with diplomatically. The same is true of his rival Maranzano. The ongoing tit for tat killing between the two genuinely wreaked havoc on not only the streets but in the mafia hierarchy itself. Those resistant to change generally don't last long, and meetings of the mafia elite tried to bring around at the end of bloodshed, but Maranzano especially consistently manipulated matters to his own advantage. In order to facilitate underworld peace, the consensus turned from diplomacy to the inevitable. One of these guys had to go. The final straw, according to the account of Nicola Gentile, was when the police informants called Messiri and said knock off the violence. Having an idealism for peace, he actually responded by disarming his men, and they were all pissed. Joe the boss, Messiri, his bodyguards, and Lucky Luciano all met at a seafood restaurant at 3 p.m. on April 15th of 1931. Luciano excuses himself from the card game while that they're playing to visit the bathroom. This is the signal for the hitmen. The bangs could be heard from around the block apparently, as Joe was hit from behind four times in the back and one in the head. And it's born, the infamous Ace of Spades shot. It added to the cult status of this hit, but many expect that the Ace of Spades card was placed between Mysterious Fingers after the hit by a photographer just for the shock factor of the press. Next is a series of photos recovered before they could be lost. Holes in a window. Former LAPD reserve officer turned photographer Merrick Morton was faffing around in the LA police department when he comes across a stash of LAPD crime photos ranging in the dates of 1920s all the way to the 1970s. These were cellulose nitrate based film and the negatives were so decomposed they're deemed fire hazard. But Merrick saw enough of the few stills to know that they'd be an absolute effing gold mine. Working with Phototech and Photo Digitation Service and the US National Film Archive the photos were given a new life. This collection is NSFW and there are hundreds. Now spruced up, the macabre photos are mostly crimes and many of them violent and depicting the bodies or surviving victims injuries. Obviously the ones you're seeing on screen as I'm talking are tamer, such as my choice, the one you're seeing now, holes in the car window. Something about it gives me a deep sense of discomfort, thus the choice. The collection contains recognizable crimes and faces too, an unusual photo of Malaya Nurmi dressed as Vampira, pictures of comedian Lenny Bruce's OD in March of 1966, and images of the Manson family arriving at the arrangement in 1970. Every photo is scary, and every single has a disturbing backstory. Some captions are provided by author James Elroy in his book LAPD 53. You can win, but sometimes you still lose in the end. It's the devastated Disney's. Meet Howard Ashman and Alan Menken. There are some everyday photos of these two in their prime. Who were they? In case you couldn't tell by all the Disney crap in the background of said photos, they played somewhat of a big role. You know, writing the lyrics and music for Oliver and Company, The Little Mermaid, Aladdin, and Beauty and the Beast as well as a few others. Also not to mention creating The Little Shop of Horrors, which got them hired by Disney in the first place. And in this photo you see now, they had just won the Oscars for The Little Mermaid. Hooray! But why does Ashman look so unhappy? This was his life's accomplishments. It's because that night Ashman told Menken they needed 
to have a serious talk when they got back to New York. And when they get back a few days later, Ashman admits that he has HIV that's quickly progressed and he's going to die soon and fast. They had been songwriting partners for over a decade and were in the middle of working on Beauty and the Beast and despite the illness, Ashman completed the lyrical work and the initial work on Aladdin. On the morning of March 14, 1991, he does die from heart failure caused by his condition. At the time of his death, he only weighed 80 pounds, he'd lost his sight and could barely speak, and a voice that spoke so eloquently through song was lost forever. Before he passed, however, Disney Productions scrambled to finish the film so he could see a screening of it. The film earned Ashman and Menken three 1991 Academy Award nominations for Best Song and the title song winning the award. Perhaps most amazingly, Beauty and the Beast was the first animated film ever nominated for an Academy Award for Best Motion Picture. So it looks like a photo of two men achieving their wildest dreams, but it's a record of their last normal moment together. Oh look, it's the D-Bags Day Off! Camp staff! Check out this jolly go lucky group. They got the day off of work because the weather was nice for the first time in a long time. During the war time that must have been awesome, especially being young. Finally shirk responsibility, maybe go get a pint, have a picnic, hang out with each other, maybe get a little frisky, lavishing in the sun. I'm done looking at them. In fact, I'm sick by having to look at them. When that group of people is going to have lighted and silly summer fun on a day off, they're going back to their jobs at the camps of World War II. To do exactly what you're thinking they would be doing for work when I say they work at the camps of World War II. And they enjoyed it. This wasn't one of those mandatory war jobs or excuses you can make up for following orders. These young adults who may as well be the grandmothers, grandfathers, or great grandma or pa of people even watching chose to do this job and actively enjoyed it. So this is a good reminder it's not that far in the past and these people most likely took lives shortly before or after this photo was taken. Uh, did Halloween come early or is it just Sylvester Claus? Yeah, so um, I chose this photo out of trust me like thousands of equally creepy ones because I feel it truly captures the what the bleep factor this holiday has. And they do it every 31st of December to 13th of January. The Sylvester Claus and of Ernotch and the surrounding area Appenzell custom that is famous throughout Switzerland. The custom derives its charm from the unique blending of contrasts such as nature and art, mystery and tradition, harmony and anarchy. The Sylvester Claus that ushered the old year out and ring in the new. There are three types of these clauses. The beautiful, the ugly, and the pretty ugly. Common to all the clauses are bells in various shapes and sizes that they wear on their bodies. Their rituals begin in the early morning each day. The various shupal meet at the village square before each group goes its own way. A group will pull up in front of your house, then hop around and jump up and down to make the bells ring and then they start yodeling at you. You listen to the yodel, they say happy new year, give you some cash, some liquor you have to drink from a straw and then they just leave. Dark backstory gossip however, in times of poverty and hunger which afflicted the region frequently, Clausen was a way to earn a little extra money and in the 1930s what was known as Belchel Claus aka the beggar Claus began to appear on the streets. Essentially homeless Santa Clauses but Santa looked like that. As a result the influx of beggars in the Claus guide resulted and heavy restrictions and in the 1950s the custom had nearly died out. It's only thanks to the initiative of individuals in the 1970s that this got to come back and enjoys enormous popularity today. Somebody come get their creepy uncle. Cannot tell me this isn't the energy this photo gives. Creepy uncle. The woman is unidentified but definitely a follower to be able to handle that guy's BO and greasy hands on her. It was taken of the Children of God leader David Berg. This group started in 1968 in California after Berg claimed God himself had gifted him with prophecies. In reality, Berg started making extreme demands of his followers, give up their money, worldly possessions in exchange for limited outside access, horrible cramped living conditions, brainwashing, and oh yeah, a would make this group famous for really bad reasons I can't and would rather not get into. Former members of COG have been outspoken about the childhood they suffered growing up in the communes. Actress Rose McGowan, the most famously outspoken, published her story of nine years in the group. Actors Joaquin and River Phoenix, also raised in the cult, had it harder than Rose and that trauma plagued River especially. He was actually the original heartthrob of the 80s and 90s, a role, fun fact, DiCaprio only managed to take once River's substance addiction caused by his traumatic childhood unfortunately took his life. So more of an unfun fact, but the matter stands that River painted the way for DiCaprio and this psycho ruined a lot of people's lives. Have you ever seen a photo you can feel? Before you see the photo itself, you're going to learn about the man in it. So Joseph Goebbels, a national socialist politician and propagandist who held multiple high rank roles in the uh, Yahtzee party. As a party chief for Greater Berlin, 1926-45, to 45, Reich leader of propaganda, 1929-40, to 
1945, and in 1933, the push broom mustache twit appointed Joseph the Minister for Propaganda and Public Enlightenment. He was a devout and brittle through and through bigot, a tireless agitator, and the propaganda this man designed, wrote, and funded had shipped through dozens of countries and shaped the perspective of Jews in a way that can actually never be undone. It's this propaganda many people still cite when asked for factual basis or logical argument as what Jews had done oh so wrong. It's Joseph who orders the mass burning of literature, who sentenced thousands to death, and who made up lies to ensure hatred, a hatred that still stands today. And I want you guys to see how he looked at them. So here is the photo, finally. This is a picture of Joseph Goebbels taken only seconds after he found out the photographer was Jewish. In this photo, you can feel it. And it's effing terrifying. And now, the last photo is from El Monte, 6 May. That's the date written on this photo, from the LAPD Collective, and it's the only other photo from said collection I chose to put on this list aside from the holes in the car window. As follows is the photo and James L. Roy's written description of it. This is a detective modeling a mask worn by Baxter Shorter's crew. Shorter was in a gaggle with Emmett Perkins, Jack Santos, and Barbara Graham. The three of them then killed an old woman named Mabel Monahan on 9 March 1953. Shorter was appalled by his gaggle's violence. He ratted the others out and Santo and Perkins kidnapped him in front of his pad on Bunker Hill, took him to the mountains, and killed him. Shorter had a sister that lived in El Monte, and they were hunting through it for evidence. This mask was in her pad, James Elroy. If Mabel Monahan's former son-in-law, Tudor Scherer, hadn't been a Las Vegas gambler, the 60-year-old widow probably would have never been killed. Also, if she didn't stay friends with him after he divorced her daughter, that'd probably have helped. But she did, and people found that weird. So there had to be something at play, right? Maybe Scherer trusted her so much he stored his 100 grand floats there. Ex-cons Emmett Perkins, John True, and Jack Santos think that and they plan to take it. Barbara Graham joins the group to be their key into the door. Mabel takes a while to open up, but Barbara persuades her with the story of a broken down car and pleas for the phone. Mabel was reluctant, but the young woman was alone and the widow knew firsthand how scary it could be for a woman to be on her own at night, so she let her in. And in comes John True, Jack, Emmett, wearing rubber masks. We're gonna take a pause. Ladies and female presenters, our own sex does not guarantee our safety and you can't predict anyone's intentions. Please trust your gut if it says don't open that door. Mabel is struck on the head, left gagged and bleeding in the hallway. The group ransacks her home for a safe that never exists and panic when there is none, so they just leave her there. Mabel is dead for two days in her home before she's found. The investigation into the slaying of the Burbank widow began and it was a long one, filled with drama. In the end, the four are charged with conspiracy to commit burglary, robbery, and M-word on June 3rd, 1953, in the death of Miss Mabel Monahan.